Good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Uh, the first thing that uh, I am going to present you is um, the wonderful video our communication team did uh, um, for the project that is just around here with us. Uh, and uh, please go ahead. in Europe, where 120 partners from 30 This is a story about EU Jamrai 2 and the power of being one. A story that begins in Europe, where 120 partners from 30 different countries discovered that they shared a common challenge, reduce antimicrobial resistance. A big challenge, true, but they also discovered that by joining forces, connecting, sharing knowledge and building a One Health community on AMR, they are much stronger. They can create a great shield. And not only that, acting as one, they are bigger, more visible and reach further and more people. Together, they are building a One Health world to reduce antimicrobial resistance because they understand all areas of health as a single challenge. They are one, sharing strategies, promoting rational use and ensuring access to treatments. One, preventing, monitoring and providing sustainable global responses. One, with a symbol that unites not only them, but the whole world. We are EU Jamrai 2 and we are ready to embrace the power of being one to reduce antimicrobial resistance. Media, uh, we're the symbol, everything, you are the ambassadors. So, now, th uh, after thanking all of you to being here, thanking the people that is online, and uh, all partners and uh, uh, our our collaborators, um, I want to go um, a bit more in deep on what is the project because you are a task of a work package, but uh, you belong to a much more um, bigger uh, project and uh, well it is the <laughs> the voting part but it's also important that you uh, get to know uh, what you are um, to what you are belonging so uh, let's get started let's have a, a very fruitful um, uh, workshop this workshop is um, it's about uh, putting all the partners together in the environmental uh, AMS uh, to, uh, to think what you were doing these last months and what we are going to do uh, in, in the next uh, uh, three years almost now, uh, because it's been uh, uh, a while since uh, the project started. So let's, let's go for... Uh -uh. <laughs> I don't know when. It's not working, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe it's up. No. The first thing. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give an overview uh, of uh, what is the importance and what are the things that you need to know around the rest of the packages. Um, uh, how is our governance? Because um, some of you uh, belong to the EU Jam Right One, but uh, most of you are also new. Um, and things have slightly changed because we get uh, much bigger than the, the first hand Jam Right. So um, I think it's worth it to know uh, where, where we are and, and where we are going and how big we are. <laughs> so I don't know. I need to give some. Ground rules here, sorry. This is a Q, uh, the Q code. Please take your time to the, to to take it because uh, we are gonna have the answers and questions here. So um, one thing that we have is that we are uh, uh, doing a streaming. So um, 
this uh, gives us an opportunity to have more people involved in this in this workshop, but also some uh, other downsides. That is that we need to uh, be careful where we are sh when when we are sharing our ideas and everything. So please uh, use the QR code to, uh, to do your questions here and online as well, and also. Um, if you uh, raise your hand, please wait for, your, uh, for the micro. My colleagues will bring you a mic, because if not, uh, the, your voice is not heard in, in uh, the streaming. So um, I'm sorry for that, uh, but I think we, we, can, uh, we can do this slightly uh, thing to, to involve also our online partners. So uh, the overview of Jan Wright. We, uh, it's founded with 50 million. I, know, I don't know if uh, the people uh, from the Jam Drive One remember how much uh, money they had in, uh, in the past, but it was uh, more or less 5 million. So imagine the, uh, the jump uh, and the commitment that uh, we did with the Commission to, to deliver. So the granting authority is the European Health and Digital Agency, HADEA, as we, as we call it, and it, uh, it's under the uh, EU for Health program. Uh, we have uh, all the countries, the 27 countries, plus Iceland, Norway, and Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and the duration is four years. Uh, so, well, we almost have three years uh, to go. Uh, all the beneficiaries um, are stated here are, are around 120 uh, or 21, I guess. Um, so it is a very big project. What are the differences between what we did in the bus and, and what we have to do uh, with the EU Jan Right 2? So the EU Jan Right uh, 1 was, um, uh, was uh, thought to develop effective One Health policies. Uh, to reduce AMR. The challenge uh, that we have with AOGAN right too is that we need to support the, uh, the, the member states to implement measures to, to tackle the AMR and improve the citizens' health. So we are changing from um, giving advice to make policies to implement things in the countries. So this is uh, uh, from big, bigger importance. So, what are the general objectives that we have in the in the in the project? Um, we need to provide direct and sizable support, as I said before, uh, to be able to update the national action plans. We also need to strengthen the responsiveness and coordination of the health systems to protect people from AMR in the union. Uh, now you are taking and thinking how your health system is, uh, is organized and how, what is the challenge that, uh, that you have in your own countries. Uh, I am thinking in mine. <laughs> so it is a, a huge challenge ahead. And also uh, we commit to be uh, the best practice in, in region, uh, in the, uh, the best practice region in the world. So the three very challenging uh, objectives that we have ahead. And for AMS, for the work package six, uh, we commit uh, to support uh, the development and implementation of these uh, core elements in the national action plans. So how we are structured? We are structured in uh, 10 packages. We have the coordination one that is, uh, is led by INSERM in France. Uh, they are in charge of uh, all the administrative, let's say, part of the project, and uh, they are also in charge of representing our coordinator is Marie Cecile Ploy. Um, she is uh, responsible of uh, the outcomes of the, of the um, uh, project and also to uh, be the ambassador of, of us in, in, in front of the rest of the uh, organizations. So the World Package 2 and World Package 10 is uh, led by uh, our excellent communication team that is with us today uh, in the dissemination uh, packages uh, co-leading with INSERM as well. 
Um, and uh, they are leading the, the tent for uh, awareness and communication. Here, because one of the commitments that we have in, uh, in uh, EU Young Rai and as um, the Spanish liaison or member of the network of liaisons, I have to say, is that um, um, we are taught to not work in silos. So we need co to communicate. We need to make them aware that we are uh, doing this kind of uh, workshops to give uh, some awareness at what we are doing. So please uh, take them into, into account in the coffee. They will uh, be very happy to chat with you and, and give their contact and everything. So um, the work pack three and work package four uh, are uh, one uh, important part that I wanna go in deep in, in the next uh, slides because uh, is uh, the work package um, around evaluation and impact and around sustainability. The sustainability package is something that I believe we were a bit missing or was not that important in the EU Young Right one, but this, in, this, uh, in this EU Young Right is crucial because we are implementing in national action plans. So when you implement things, you need a sustainability plan to maintain it in time. So uh, it's of great importance, and that's why I'm gonna extend myself a little bit. And then the work package five, I belong to this work package because uh, it's the one of the uh, EU Janrai liaisons. The, uh, posi this position is um, a bit uh, uh, difficult to explain, but um, as I am uh, doing it is that this uh, position on myself here in Spain, for instance, is that uh, I am in charge of connecting the national action plan with the EU and right uh, activities and everything. So. Um, in some countries it's more difficult. Here I had the chance to uh, have the National Action Plan coordinators working also in the Young Rise, so I, I, I am lucky <laughs> to do that. So, and then uh, the core of the, of the project. The, the, all those packages that I explained is uh, like the, the supporting packages, but then we have the World Package 6, where you belong, that is anti antibiotic stewardship, that then the World Package 7, that is infection prevention and control, World Package, World, World package 8, One Health AMR surveillance, and 9, the antibiotic access, a very important one, and that we partner with a lot. Um, again, we should be in contact, I, I know, environmental uh, 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 tasks are uh, working together in several things, uh, but uh, yeah, I need to say it on and on and on because we, need, we cannot work in silos uh, to, to tackle AMR. So how is the governance structure? This is a bit, a bit the boring part, but uh, maybe gives you a, a bit of context and how complex the decisions can be. And, uh, and uh, can hopefully I can transmit that we need to be patient a bit to get some answers from uh, coordination <laughs> and from uh, other statements. So uh, uh, we have an advisory committee that we need, to, uh, um, we need to report and also they guide us. Uh, uh, in strategic decisions, uh, then the executive board that is uh, um, uh, that belong the uh, work package leaders, mainly the coordinators and also the project managers as well. As well. So um, in this executive board, uh, we we um, analyze uh, the the possible risk. We go. Uh, through all the packages mm, being um, um, analyzing what is going on and how we go. And if we need to take some uh, actions, uh, we escalate it or, or, or we take it there. So 
For some consults and advices, we are creating this stakeholders forum uh, where we are going to have uh, European partnerships and other um, other associations and uh, in patients, human and animal health associations, and probably industry representatives just to uh, have like a place where we can seek for advice or, or, or consults when we are stuck in some, some travels. So then we have the General Assembly that uh, we will have it uh, uh, in, in February in Bilbao. Uh, uh, then the second one, where what controls more or less uh, what the executive board is deciding and taking, taking things. So after that, a little bit more of uh, World Package 3 because I think it's uh, a, a bit new on, on, the, uh, on this uh, project and uh, also a bit of the watch World Package 4 because I am uh, very excited about sustainability. <laughs> uh, I, I am always telling my colleagues always, did you think what you are going to do with this after four years? It's always my question to, to them when we are discussing. Um, so, monitoring and evaluation. Um, we need to uh, stick to the, to the deadlines. Uh, for that, they created a whole package to uh, make sure that we, are, that, that we meet the deadlines on our derivables and milestones. So first, they will ask us to have a self-assessment uh, before uh, to, to you uh, and everything, and then uh, we will have to send in advance uh, of the, the deliverable date um, deadline. Uh, to the World Package 3 team, uh, the work. So uh, we are missing uh, one month there uh, to deliver things. And then uh, we will have an external evaluation as well by the stakeholders. So um, this is to uh, make sure that you are aware that time uh, is precious and uh, that we need to um, uh, we need to come across another step that was not uh, um, planned before, well, was planned, but was not um, uh, doing before in, in the EU and right uh, one. But sorry. So, uh, what are the key elements of, of this? Uh, it's a process that uh, should be dynamic, interactive, talk to each other, you, we need a strong communication. We got um, uh, really, uh, we, we make a lot of pressure, mainly here in the World Package 6, to have the teams to uh, communicate with all of us. So please use uh, the tools that we have uh, to talk to each other and not work in silos. <laughs> so indicators. We had to, to give indicators to, uh, to the work, pack, uh, work package three more than the deliverables that we have in the grant agreement. So more um, uh, to be able to evaluate uh, that, that we are on track. I mean, we, we need to be on track. We are a huge project with a lot of money involved. So uh, we need to have more control. I'm sorry, but it's what it is. So, um, and after that, um, what are the pilot actions and implementations into the NAPS? We need to engage the member states and actors. I am lucky because uh, the National Action Plan in Spain is uh, extremely involved in a huge right. It's not, I know it's not happening in the rest of the country. So please, uh, if you are a partner that do not belong to a, your national action plan, please contact the a liaison uh, and, and make sure that the national action plan is uh, involved in your country because uh, at the end of the day, they are the ones in, that need to implement what we uh, get here. So, objectives of the sustainability part, uh, that our work doesn't uh, die for in four years. So, 
this is more or less the, uh, what, what these work packets need to do. And um, it is uh, like the work package five mandatory. So you cannot, you cannot escape. Uh, all the countries need to be involved in the sustainability part. Why? Because only the people in the country know how they are gonna sustain the project in their countries. I mean, the, how, how the national action plans are in place in each country is different, so they need to, to be involved, all of them. I cannot tell to Portugal or to Greece what they have to do <laughs> if they don't know, right? So, uh, liaison, uh, we have a meeting in, in November the first live meeting. Um, this was a, a, um, a controversy position in the EU YAMRAI, and countries um, understood it uh, in, in differently uh, depending on uh, how they, they were uh, organized inside. But uh, I think we are coming to, to, the, to the solution of being, um, yeah, um, a person that links the project with a national action plan and also links with uh, the policy makers that need to uh, develop some, some policies yet to, to allow the national action plans to uh, be organized in the, in the proper way. So, we are complementary with other actions. The EU for, uh, for Health program has a lot of them, a lot of them. So we are mixed with, we, we are, we are uh, in contact with a lot of associations, the, the uh, World Health Organizations, the OECD, the other projects, uh, EDUCARE, I am, I am thinking now with uh, uh, the environmental part. So um, we cannot be only focused on what we are doing in New York, right? It's also true that we are the biggest project as well, but if we have the chance to help the other uh, smaller projects to uh, uh, move forward and, and, uh, and uh, do a whole uh, and holistic uh, approach, to, to what we are doing would be very nice. So, techniques. <laughs> so now, this is <laughs> the end of, the <laughs> of my presentation. <laughs> and, now <laughs> and now I am presenting you Ricardo Carapeto that is going to... Uh <laughs> Yeah, you can hold it, uh, or I can hold it for you here. <laughs> so uh, he is going to go through uh, the task and everything. Do you want to take this? No, uh, no, no. It's fine. You. So please, a round of applause to Ricardo. Right. <laughs> you said you would do it in less than 15 minutes. And, and you I'm lied. Not, no, you right? Lied. <laughs> I'm right? You lied. I'm <laughs> ah, I lied. Yeah, I always lie. You know. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, hello, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, hello, Jairo. I didn't see you this morning. <laughs> uh, um, it's really great that we get together all here. So I, I re I'm really thankful for, for you uh, coming to Madrid and taking, making the effort of, of, uh, uh, of coming here because uh, uh, I think it's easier working with people that you know personally and, and being more engaged when you know people rather than you just connect because it's more difficult to, 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 to make things and, and get a, a commitment when you're just connected as many others meetings that we have. So it's great that we are all, all here. Thank you very much uh, for all of you that came here. Also, thank you for the people that is uh, um, working in, in the back of the, of the room and the, and the events manager and everybody involved. Uh, um, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Lida and, and, and Leonidas, for their help, uh, communication team, and especially Anne. 
I know that he, she has gone through difficult moments. I only know small parts of it, but uh, uh, it has been a very difficult, uh, a very difficult uh, thing to arrange all this, and it just looked perfect. So, so thank you very much, Anne, for for that. Um, so, yeah, the presentation is already there. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to give a, an overview of uh, um, of our specific task. Um, where should I point? To what? And uh, I don't know where should I point. Where is the computer? Okay, somewhere. On the apretado tú? I cannot do it without the presentation, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. See? Well, in the meantime, I'm in, uh, Ricardo Carapeto. Uh, um, Carapeto is a surname. Uh, it's impressive because it's, uh, uh, it's strange in Spanish, I guess, that also in other languages, but it's a, it's a real surname. It's not, a, it's not a nickname or, or, or whatever. Uh, so it appears that we have the first slide. I don't know if somebody's going to go through the slides. And should I ask uh, a next slide? And well, that is the the, um, the index of the of the presentation. We will talk about the. I uh, will give you some um, um, uh, information about the overview of the work package seats uh, and then uh, of the specific uh, tasks uh, that we have the task that we have been allocated. The six point uh, uh, point three. I don't know if we can go to the next slide. Yep. Ah, it's already working. Okay, great. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. Okay, right. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, it works. So overview. This is the people that is involved uh, um, uh, in this uh, in this work package. Uh, uh, you all know some of us because uh, we are we are already here. Uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, work package is led by by Spain and, and Greece. So so we have uh, colleagues from the National Public Health Organization in Greece and, and also colleagues from the Spanish Medicine Agency. That is where I work. Uh, in the area of the uh, of the environment, and also we have uh, uh, all the staff in our agencies, Greek and, and uh, Greece and and um, and Spain, that are involved in the in the development of the task. Just to introduce them to you, um, it's not working very well. Oh, it's working too good, too well now. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Oye, si os digo que me paséis la diapositiva, yo creo que mejor, ¿eh? Vale, sorry, sorry for the Spanish. So, yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, siguiente. Siguiente. Ah, bueno, well, okay. So, these are the, the three um, tasks that are part of the work package uh, uh, six. The, the first one uh, uh, is related to humans, um, human health. Uh, um, uh, the second one is related to, to animal health. The third one is the is the one that we are working in is uh, related to the environment, and the fourth is on on behavioral uh, uh, change. Uh, I, I wanted to, to to stop here just a second because uh, uh, when we were defining how would the jam right be, uh, um, we decided to go through this design always. Uh, so the point ones uh, will always be related to humans. Points twos. Points two will always be related to, to animals, and points three will always be related to uh, um, uh, environment. When it comes to stewardship, I don't know if in your home languages you have a direct translation of the word stewardship, but in the past I have struggled a lot to understand what the hell is uh, is a stewardship and what does it mean. Uh, so so uh, I, I will give you which were my, my conclusions because I think it's important to know, understand what we are doing here and to do it in collaboration with the uh, humans and vets, etc. Um, yeah, vets, etc. So the stewardship is, is the, is the um, uh, interventions that are aiming at optimizing the use of antimicrobials. Okay, 
that is valid for any um, uh, stakeholders that is a stakeholder that is involved in the prescription because they are able to, to reduce and optimize the use of course uh, uh, from uh, pharmacists, uh, uh, doctors, veterinarians, uh, uh, dentists, etc. But it's not so valid or not directly for the environment because the stakeholders that are involved in the environment cannot really do stewardship because they cannot really optimize the, 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 the use of, uh, of antibiotics. Okay, uh, And that uh, um, make us think then uh, how would the environment be, could be included in the stewardship and we thought that the way that the environment could be involved in the stewardship, understanding that we cannot uh, um, optimize the use of antimicrobials, uh, would be to reduce as much as possible the emission to the, to the environment of antimicrobials. So that is the idea of the stewardship in the environment. A reduction uh, of all the stakeholders involved, a reduction as much as possible of residues of antimicrobials and resistances to the, to the environment. So that is the, that is the idea. What happened here, uh, when we were defining how would the, uh, the 6.3 look, um, uh, is that the environmental part uh, in uh, national action plans has always been less developed in other countries that uh, uh, is valid for any countries where you're coming from. Uh, so there is less development for, for the environment and many of the stakeholders that are uh, relevant for the environmental part have never been part of public health or, or, or whatever. So they are not really aware of what does antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, imply. And that is a huge difference. Uh, if you talk to vets, if you talk to, to, to doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, it's very easy to go to them and make them see how important is this issue. But if you go and talk to engineers or, or people involved in the, in the or farmers, uh, uh, it's way more difficult to make them aware uh, of the importance of public health, of this issue in, in public health. So that's why we decided that the stewardship in the environment and understanding that it is less developed in other countries, that's why we decided that the first step should be uh, to make a training. Uh, and that's why we are making a training, we are developing a training. First of all, to make everybody that is related, first of all, to, to identify all the people, stakeholders that are related to this part of reducing the emissions as much as possible. Second of all, to make them aware of all the problems that are related to AMRs in the environment. And third of all, within the, the training, we will explore uh, uh, the possibilities of reducing the, the, the actual emission of uh, uh, antibiotics. So I think that it's important to keep in mind why are we doing that and why are we in this part of the, uh, 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 of the uh, project. And that's why I wanted to spend just, uh, I mean, my God, eight minutes, uh, um, uh, um, uh, just a minute in, in saying that. So I have to go quicker now. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I think this is, has already been uh, um, explained by, uh, by Marta, but, uh, uh, but uh, we have interactions uh, uh, with other work packages, and this is uh, specific for, for our uh, group. Uh, no. Um, so we have support from the coordination group uh, and communication and the liaisons, of course, and we have to deliver uh, um, indicators and, and, uh, uh, and sustainability. And we have collaboration with War Packet 7, 8, and 9 that are related to infection prevention and control, the War Packet 7 that also has an environmental part, War Packet 8 that is related to surveillance that also has a, an environmental part, and the same applies to War Packet 9 that is a, a collaboration with them. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. And next one? Yeah. Uh, so, when we come to six, uh, the task uh, 6.3, uh, these are, uh, as I said, collected by, um, or collected, I, I don't know how to say that, uh, with uh, um, uh, Greek colleagues and, and, and Spanish colleagues uh, from, from the uh, National Public Health Organization in Greece. We have Leonidas and Lidas. They are sitting here. And you will, well, you have already met them, but, you, but they will uh, present in a later stage. Uh, and from the Spanish side, uh, uh, we have Anne, that uh, you all know, and myself, that you also know because I'm here now. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, there are seven countries involved in this, uh, um, uh, in this um, uh, task, specific task. I won't go through the name of all the institutions because sometimes it's difficult for me to pronounce and, and uh, so, so just to let you know that 
those are the institutions are coming uh, uh, from uh, uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, Germany, Denmark, um, Belgium, Greece, and Spain. Yeah, and I think there's nobody missing. And we are more than 45 people, so, so um, uh, it's a big team. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So on the objectives uh, uh, here, uh, we have defined uh, for this uh, um, task 6.3, we have defined a number of subtasks. Uh, you already know this because uh, um, uh, this all has been circulated and is nicely written uh, um, in our in our team's channel. Uh, and in there, we have for these different subtasks uh, uh, defined objectives and actions. So, so the first one you can see there is to define which are the target groups. That was important to to understand who was, is involved or who can do something to reduce the mission of antibiotics and resistances to the environment. The second one is to search for existing training material to try to avoid, avoid as much as possible to duplicate efforts. Uh, the third one is uh, 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 the, the development of a training or a toolkit uh, um, uh, that will be the, 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 the specific training. And the, the, the last one is to uh, uh, test this, uh, this training material that we have done. So within the project, we will um, uh, go, the, the end will be to develop a training uh, um, affecting to all the relevant stakeholders that we have identified and to run a pilot of this, uh, uh, of this project, okay? And in future actions, uh, uh, we will see uh, how to spread this, uh, um, uh, this training so it can be held in different countries. But now for this project, we will only run uh, a pilot to test it and to improve it, okay? Uh, next slide, please. Three minutes to go. Uh, um, so. Here are the most important things. Uh, Marta said that we are uh, obliged by, by the grant agreement to, to uh, um, uh, provide to the work package three, I think it is, indicators, uh, um, uh, a certain amount of information in very um, strict deadlines, okay? Uh, and those are the most important parts. So, so we have the milestones and indicators. That is something that we uh, have to, uh, th those are in blue and um, darker green in, in, in the, uh, um, right part of the of the screen, uh, the ones in yellow and light green are more internal uh, indicators that help us to to keep everything in in track. But the ones that we have to to fulfil and be very strict are the ones in in, in blue and and, and dark uh, uh, dark green. So um, uh, I think I'm going to go to the next slide uh, because I'm already late. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, the indicators that we have for the for the 6.3, uh, we have one process indicator that is that we need to have at least 12 meetings with the stakeholder representatives. Uh, that is in the mm, mm, uh, whole four-year project thing. So, so that is something easy to achieve and uh, uh, um, uh, that doesn't concern us. Uh, um, and we need to have also to to deliver uh, two outcome indicators. Uh, one of them is a target. Uh, audience ident um, identification report that has already been done. No, Diana? Uh, no, 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 yep. Uh, and then uh, once we have developed all the training material, etc., um, we have to produce a report on how did it go the the pilot uh, uh, the pilot training. Those are the, the two things that we have to do. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. On the subtask allocation, that was uh, um, uh, important because uh, we as coordinators uh, uh, have all your collaboration and that is an and expertise, of course, and that is uh, really good. Uh, but we need it, as you have seen, there are subtasks that have been defined and we need people to, uh, uh, to, to be in charge of those subtasks and, and lead uh, uh, those specific subtasks. So what we did, and we have done that for the first part of the, uh, for this year, but we'll be, mm, uh, this is the way we will work, uh, uh, is to distribute the people uh, uh, in the different uh, tasks based on the expertise that we know that you have from your uh, CVs or work or whatever, and your expressed preference. So, so we also ask, uh, what do you prefer? So, so it's not like a dictatorship, like you're going to do this. No, no, we'll also ask, okay? If you are happier in some other place or, or whatever, uh, um, uh, you can also tell us. Uh, the roles within the different subtasks, if you are going just to contribute or you are going to lead or whatever uh, um, will be based on the staff effort that you were uh, that you claimed the, during the um, um, 
a grant agreement because uh, uh, you are going to get more money or less money depending on the staff effort that you are all allocated with and that is something that you have um, uh, uh, asked for. So we understand that if you have higher ha uh, staff effort uh, uh, you should be more involved in the, uh, in the, in the task and the subtask and that's why we have uh, defined the, the subtask leaders uh, depending on the staff effort. Okay, the staff effort that you can see here is only for the, is for the whole work package um, uh, 6 and not for the specific 6.1 but we use that as a guidance. Okay, uh, next slide please. Uh, the work dynamics, you already know that we uh, use Microsoft Teams as a collaboration channel. It works uh, uh, really well. Sometimes uh, uh, we have some problems. I, I, I know that in, in Germany, and that does not affect only to BFR, BFR, BFR uh, but everybody working in, in Germany, uh, in BVL, in UBA, they always have troubles with, uh, with Teams. I don't know why, but... <laughs> But it happens. But uh, we have to to go through that and and uh, and try to 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 fix it with that, uh, our IT people because at the end it's uh, the most common and and useful tool for for working uh, collaboratively and and, and online. Um, uh, we will have periodic follow, follow up meetings with the subtask leaders to check how everything is going. We are already doing that, and uh, we are. Um, we will have annual meetings to, to ensure that everything is uh, uh, on time. Next slide, please. Well, more oh, great. Uh, just two minutes late. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, now uh, the, the, the work. <laughs> so we are going to start the outcomes of, uh, of the task. Uh, with uh, our first uh, person, that is uh, Anela Buru. Uh, she's gonna go through the pre pre preliminary subtask in identification of target audiences. So. Well, it's a big challenge to present after Ricardo, I'm not that funny. <laughs> Good. I'm going to present the first action that was carried out as a preliminary activity to the rest of the subtasks, which is the identification of target audiences to train. Well, good, it works. <laughs> to begin, I'll present our main objectives and the actions we've taken. From there, we'll dive into the methodology and some of the most important highlights before moving on to the outcomes. And finally, I'll sum things up with conclusions. So let's start with objectives and actions. Good. The goal of this activity was to identify uh, target audiences and stakeholders beyond the typical prescribers like, like doctors or veterinarians, expanding to include uh, other groups such as farmers or wastewater managers. Aside from the obvious importance of this task, because we need to define who we want to train, this is crucial for any kind of educational intervention. This activity is also highly relevant in the project. As Ricardo mentioned in his presentation, uh, this is the first indicator we must report to Work Package 3, making it a top priority for meeting the evaluation criteria. Good. Regarding the me um, methodology and insights, to give you an overview, we designed a four-step methodology that included first gathering internal feedback from partners in task 6.3 on which sectors and professionals should be included uh, in our intervention. Next, we conducted a literature review to find out which stakeholders are sharing the most relevant insights on the topic and to see if there are any guidelines for involving audiences in this kind of intervention. In the third step, we cross-referenced the information gathered from the first two steps and categorized all the relevant stakeholders according to their priority for intervention. And finally, we explored these stakeholders at the national level to create an address book of potential collaborators. Well, 
All right, for step one, we created and distributed a survey among our task participants with the goal of defining the target audiences at three different levels, from more organizational to more individual. First, the stakeholders understood as sectors. Second, the target groups, which refers to the specific professional groups within each sector. And third, the multisectoral representatives of the professional groups identified. Regarding the sectors to be involved, we found that a One Health approach should be adapted with the primary focus on animal and environmental health, the agri-food sector, and the pharmaceutical industry. Additionally, um, the suggested professional groups encompass profiles at different levels. In other words, partners in task 6.3 uh, emphasize the importance of including both managers and operators from the different sectors in the training programs. And at a uh, first glance, this may not appear very significant, but it is actually crucial uh, because the distinct roles and responsibilities of each group will greatly influence the approach and content of the training programs. So by tailoring the trainings uh, to address the specific needs and expertise of the different groups of professionals, we can ensure a more effective and comprehensive understanding of practices across sectors. And moreover, this inclusive strategy will ultimately enhance collaboration and foster a more integrated response to environmental health challenges. Good. Finally, in question three, we asked respondents to identify the representatives from the country for each sector and professional group mentioned. However, they were, um, we were unable to obtain this information at this time due to concerns regarding data protection. <laughs> so this issue is regulated by European uh, legislation, is addressed in Article 15, and it's also been emphasized during the scientific meetings with the general coordination. So our team uh, made a significant effort to respect this aspect, and I'll explain how we handle it in more detail later. Good. Secondly, as I mentioned, we conducted a literature review to explore the concept of antimicrobial stewardship and to identify which stakeholders should be involved in initiatives within this field. Uh, we primarily focus on the recommendations and best practice guidelines for coordination and collaboration published by the Quadripartite. As you may know, this group includes the World Health Organization, um, the World Organization for Animal Health, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the United Nations Environment Program. And besides, we also considered the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and other key European agencies, such as the European Center for Disease Control, Prevention and Control, sorry, uh, the European Food Safety Authority, and the European Medicines Agency. Good. So how does the literature define antimicrobial stewardship and what does it mean in the environmental context we are discussing? We found that traditionally the definition of antimicrobial stewardship um, refers to the rational use of antimicrobials in clinical settings, particularly antibiotics, with pharmacists and prescribers uh, being the main leaders. However, with the rise of the One Health approach, the definition of antimicrobial stewardship is expanding to include not just healthcare, but also other sectors. And this broader approach focuses on a few key areas like adopting more sustainable practices across different fields, uh, improving waste management, or keeping an eye on antimicrobial levels in our ecosystems. And it also, <coughs> sorry, it also highlights the importance of raising awareness about how antimicrobial use can affect the environment. So this means that we are now involving a wider range of prof professionals who were not traditionally associated with antimicrobial stewardship. What does the literature say about which stakeholders should be considered in this type of interventions? It's important to note that the COVID-19 pandemic stressed out the need for more coordinated systems to prepare for and respond to health 
uh, crisis, cross-border health crisis. And consequently, we found a wealth of recent post-pandemic literature that is highly relevant, including guidelines for developing sustainable national cooperation frameworks, a strategic collaboration framework for AMR and One Health, a call to action with recommendations for joint efforts, a One Health response framework in the European Union and the European Economic Area, and the European Council's recommendation to promote cooperation against antimicrobial resistance. So based on these reference documents, we developed Table 1 of the report, which serves as a conceptual framework for the different stakeholders mentioned as having a direct or indirect influence on antimicrobial stewardship. So this table encompasses all actors involved in public health, human health, pharmacy, environmental health, animal health, food production, and moreover, it delves into four different uh, categories, including authorities, professionals, academia, and the general public. Well, once we have a clear understanding of all the multisectoral actors that could be involved, we categorize them based on their priority for training. This is a crucial step, since our task has limited time and budget, of course. And so by, up, by prioritizing, we can make the most of our resources and ensure that the key audiences get the attention they need, which improves the effectiveness and positive impact of our efforts. Good. How did we go about this categorization? Well, we explored each actor's roles in terms of responsibilities and their competencies in terms of proficiency to identify gaps and determine the top concerns regarding issues with a high impact on resistance in the environment. It's important to note that in this preliminary stage, uh, the roles and competencies described are only those that are expected. We will gather more information in later phases, particularly in the gap analysis and needs assessment. Well, on the screen, you can see table two of the report, which outlines the categories, sectors, and domains along, along with the expected roles and competencies. We used a color coding system. Competencies where we expect high proficiency are marked in blue, while those with expected deficiencies are highlighted in pink and red. So please, again, remember that these expectations are based on initial assessment, we still need to conduct a complete gap analysis. So for instance, among legislative agents, we expect them to have a strong understanding of legislative processes. However, the knowledge about the role of the environment in AMR and public health is expected to be lower, as it is the integration of environmental considerations in national plans, in AMR national plans. Uh, when it comes to antimicrobial producers, we anticipate a strong commitment to regulatory compliance and ethical, innovative practices, yet there is still a perceived gap in knowledge regarding the environment's role in AMR and public health. Additionally, the implementation of processes and systems to limit emissions uh, remains inconsistent and limited. And again, these are expectations that we need to confirm. Good. <clears throat> Regarding health managers, we anticipate that they will have a strong understanding of waste management regulations. However, similar to other groups, there are expectations of insufficient knowledge about the role of the environment in AMR and the level of implementation of a specific stewardship program of, uh, for optimal waste or wastewater management. And then for food producers, we expect to see... Gracias. <laughs> We expect to see um, low levels of implementation for specific antimicrobial stewardship programs that include protocols for managing waste and livestock manure. Good. Regarding wastewater managers, we also expect to see heterogeneous and limited implementation of specific treatment systems for managing antimicrobial residues and resistant bacteria in wastewater, as well as insufficient monitoring and risk assessment protocols. And as for prescribers, both in human health and animal health, doctors and veterinarians, uh, while we anticipate high levels of awareness and knowledge about AMR and the impact 
on public health, we believe they may lack clarity on the role of the environment in this context. Then, among dispensers, which include community pharmacists, we expect to see high levels of knowledge about the impact of AMR on public health. We also anticipate a strong implementation of systems for the disposal of medicinal waste and the promotion of recycling for household medication packaging and waste. Despite this, uh, we believe there may still be gaps in their understanding of the role of the environment in AMR. And as we approach the end of this table, we say that knowledge within the community of students and researchers is also considered to be very variable. And finally, regarding the general public, um, we, spe we expect a similar trend where the use of take-back schemes for household medication leftovers is not always widespread. Good. Following this analysis, we outline the top concerns you see on the slide, highlighting the most urgent needs that are um, integrating the environmental approach into national antimicrobial resistance plans, limiting waste emissions from the pharmaceutical industry, optimizing the management of medicinal waste and wastewater in clinical settings, implementing sustainable practices for managing animal waste and utilizing manure in agricultural production systems, and ensuring uh, the treatment of AMR producing compounds in wastewater treatment plants. So these top concerns let us um, to define our top priority target audiences, including policy makers, antimicrobial producers, health managers, food producers, and wastewater managers, and secondary targets being <coughs> prescribers, dispensers, academia, and the general public. And in any case, um, these secondary groups will also be addressed through the collaboration with other projects and tasks, for example, with AMR Educare, that Marta mentioned before, uh, targeting medical doctors and healthcare uh, managers, or the work package then uh, on communication and public awareness um, addressing the general public. Once we define the different target audiences and their respective priorities, we, move, we moved on uh, to identify the representatives in the seven countries participating in task 6.3, given that our goal is to engage them in all phases of the project to ensure the quality and dissemination of the training materials. So in Spain, for instance, we started by inviting members of PLANET, which is the network for the national AMR plan, we also invited other stakeholders who are not yet part of this network. So we presented the project to them and provided access to the registration form displayed on the screen, allowing them to register formally. And this method also helped us deal with data protection concerns because we included a privacy policy um, with two checkboxes in the form, one for data protection and one for confidentiality. Now, ideally, all of us could use the same form or policy, but this wasn't feasible because despite existing European regulations, each country has its own set of norms. Um, so this means that each institution must manage the data of their national representatives and share it with third parties, which in this case are the partners from the task. Great. Uh, with that in mind, once each country registered its representatives, their information was compiled into a shared address book available on Teams. And this address book includes details such as representatives, country of origin, categories, sector, and domain, as well as uh, their institution, personal uh, contact information, and acknowledgement of the data protection clause. So this tool is incredibly useful because it brings all the relevant information together in one place, which makes coordinating activities and communication so much easier. And also it helps us engage with stakeholders more effectively and ensures consistent involvement from all participating countries. Well, in this map, you can see that so far, we have officially identified and registered over 80 representatives as collaborators for our task. These representatives are distributed 
across Spain, Greece, Hungary, and Belgium. And additionally, additionally, sorry, three other countries, Germany, Poland, and Denmark, are in the process of finalizing their registrations. We are planning for this network uh, expansion to be dynamic and active, because this way we can um, stay flexible and adapt to any new needs that come up during the creation of other stages of the project, like the content creation or whatever. So it helps us uh, keep engaging with new collaborators and adjust us our strategy as we go. If we take a closer look at our collaborating uh, representatives, we can see a diverse group coming together. Most of them um, represent professional associations of antimicrobial manufacturers, health uh, managers, food producers, wastewater managers, prescribers, or dispensers. And apart from that, we have significant support from academia, with universities and research centers playing a key role. We will also be working closely with national and regional administrations, which are responsible for areas like public health, environmental protection, and animal health. And finally, we have also some groups representing patients and consumers. So in short, uh, the sectors we'll work with include the animal and environmental sector, public health and human health, and the agri-food sector, and the pharmaceutical sector. For instance, here we have um, the net network we've established in Spain. You can see professional associations from both the human pharmaceutical industry and, and the animal sector. We also have the National Association of Healthcare Waste Managers, as well as colleges for doctors, pharmacists, veterinarians, and biologists. Additionally, we count on the National Association of Agri-Food Cooperatives, including other societies focused on aquaculture, poultry, or goat production, along with associations for small pet veterinarians and community pharmacists. In terms of academia, we've registered um, 10 universities across the country, along with a university hospital and a well-recognized research center. And among the authorities, we have the Ministry of the Environment, the National Center for Environmental Education, and several general directories and official regional laboratories. And additionally, we'll also collaborate with the One Health platform, which is a nationwide network promoting activities to effectively implement the One Health strategy here in Spain. And finally, we work with SIGRE, which is a non-profit organization established by the pharmaceutical sector for the environmental management of medication packaging and waste in Spain. So a big thanks to all for their willingness to collaborate and contribute to our task. So what's the, resu the result of this preliminary subtask? As you know, we've compiled the information into the target audience identification report, which has been shared internally on Teams, and we'll also be sharing it with Work Package 3 for evaluation through the REDCap platform, which is an electronic data capture tool commonly used for tracking studies progress. And finally, what conclusions uh, have we drawn from conducting this work? But we'll well, I'd like um, to highlight three key points. First, that antimicrobial stewardship in the environment involves a wide range of stakeholders from various sectors. Second, that there is a strong commitment and interest among these parties to engage in the fight against antimicrobial resistance from an environmental perspective. And third, that involving all these stakeholders in our efforts will ensure the um, trainings and interventions are aligned with actual needs of their sectors so that they are truly beneficial, which is obviously the primary mission and motivation of our project. So thank you very much for your attention. You can submit any questions uh, by scanning the code on the screen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, impressive <laughs> work that you that you did um, with all the people now uh, let's uh, welcome to the stage 
uh, to Joanna. Uh, she's uh, the leader at uh, UTH, and she's going to explain the subtask uh, 6.31, Gap Analysis and Need Assessment. So please, do you need to pass with this one? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Do you need water? No, thank you. Well, good morning. Um, uh, thank you for um, the presentation and uh, congratulations for the workshop. My name is Joanna Bulgaridi. I'm a microbiologist uh, researcher at the University of Thessaly at the Department of uh, uh, Hygiene and Epidemiology. And uh, we would um, like to present you today the tools that we're going to use for the gap analysis and assessment. Uh, we are really sorry that we do not have results and analysis of data today to present you, but we are going to okay, thank you. To go fast in the next steps. Um, I will uh, uh, fast forward this. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank everyone that contributed with uh, great comments uh, and uh, input uh, uh, to the um, uh, questionnaires that we are uh, conducting all this uh, time, uh, the team from Belgium and the teams from Spain. And of course, we would like to express our special thanks to the leader teams uh, from uh, Greece, um, the National and Public Health Organization and the Spanish Medicine Agency. And uh, the main, uh, the primary goal of uh, the subtask that we are uh, on is to identify gaps and uh, in the management of antimicrobials in order to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, and antimicrobial emission to the environment. Uh, we are going to share uh, information from gap analysis uh, in order to develop targeted training activities and to improve and enhance national action plans. To conduct the gap analysis, we must understand where we, where we are on the knowledge of the task groups we are going to uh, reach. So we must understand if and how different groups uh, are aware of their actions affect the presence of antibiotics in the environment and uh, what impact this has and if they understand that. Because then we have many steps to do if they are aware of antimicrobial stewardship. But there's a chance uh, that there are uh, groups that already perceive and apply a microbial policy, a microbial stewardship policies in their routine activities, so trainings to start from there and beyond. And of course, we must understand if these groups are willing to join training and awareness programs. So, to conduct um, a gap analysis, we believe that uh, we must understand knowledge, attitudes and practices by assessing what people know about antimicrobial stewardship, how they feel about it, and the actions they take related to antimicrobial use by highlighting misconceptions, poor practices, or lack of uh, awareness. Uh, CAP surveys provide valuable insights, um, helping to target interventions and improve the effectiveness of uh, stewardship programs. CAP surveys are really popular in research. They used for uh, research on mental health. Uh, they used on COVID-19. And we hope it uh, will uh, uh, be really useful for us too. Um, our main challenge was to understand the priority groups, but thanks to all of uh, you, we finalize and prioritize the stakeholders we are going to conduct uh, gap analysis. So we have um, uh, uh, groups for, for who uh, manufacture antimicrobials because uh, antimicrobial industry as producers of antimicrobial plays a central role in how these substances enter the environment. Uh, then we have the health managers, medical directors, clinical director, directors, and all these uh, that um, uh, are uh, with the waste and wastewater management in healthcare services. We will conduct gap analysis on food producers, mainly on uh, crop, livestock, and um, uh, aquaculture farmers. Then we have wastewater managers, and we are going to uh, uh, perform not a strictly CAP uh, survey to national authorities. We are going to see their, their personal knowledge and what they believe about the training of other teams to national authorities that uh, interact, uh, legislate, and give the guidance for all the others. So we have developed five different questionnaires. 
Uh, in preparation for conducting the gap analysis with these high priority stakeholders, we reviewed a wide range of uh, uh, relevant literature. This uh, list is um, uh, not exhaustive. Uh, guidelines, uh, legislation, papers, and uh, others. So, let me introduce you to the structure of our questionnaires. First, we will have an introduction note that briefly explains the purpose, uh, the scope, and important, the importance of the questionnaire, and provides instructions for the um, people who will uh, complete it. Then we have the main section with the questionnaires that are focused on gathering uh, key data related to the research uh, objectives. And uh, we include different type of questions in order to capture a range of information. Then there is um, a section with uh, questions for barriers, needs, and uh, future steps. And finally, we have the general questions for demographics. Uh, questions were structured based on a template that uh, leaders uh, provide us. We change uh, some formats and uh, we insert some uh, more uh, questions. We We'll start with direct uh, questions because we would like uh, the par uh, participants not to be uh, to be focused on the most relevant questions and not uh, to uh, to uh, wait until the uh, until they have uh, uh, complete uh, demographics and all uh, this. So to be focused on that, uh, we have excluded headings in order uh, to maintain responded focus and reduce bias. And as we said, as I said before, we have a diverse question formats uh, to gather uh, uh, data with multiple choice questions, ordinal scale questions, open-ended and closed-ended questions. This will be the first screen. The question is, uh, is going to be digital. We have already sent uh, our uh, questionnaires to our legal team for the privacy uh, personal details. Um, there is only uh, a, a single question for food for, uh, producers uh, that is not in the end and that uh, will be mandatory because we would like to identify the type of farm uh, participants uh, so the uh, rest of the questionnaire to be specific for them and their work. If they are um, working on more than one farming, we would like to do separate questions uh, to, for uh, each one of the area they are working on and uh, will be either conventional or organic and ecological uh, production. And here we have some samples of the questions used uh, in the questionnaire. We have knowledge level scaled questions. This is the only question that leads the participants to understand that it is about knowledge, but uh, it is about uh, very basic terms and we want to understand their background. We have questions that scale to one to eight uh, for more personalized information uh, and uh, we would like to understand um, and inside the country, this is a common question to all quest to the f five questioners to see differences in the answers. We have questions that of agreement uh, that is range one to four um, and uh, they finally they will get a score uh, for knowledge. And for the authorities in public health and environment, we have different format, just to be more formal. Uh, knowledge questions is in a multiple choice format. We have close-ended questions that is more um, uh, easy to analyze. And we have open-ended questions that is risky for anal uh, to analysis, but we hope uh, qu uh, answers will be uh, in um, we will we'll manage to, to analyze them. And the same for attitude-based scale questions, one to four uh, on the level of agreement. And we have practice-based questions uh, scaled, uh, which, where we want the level of agreement with uh, statements of practices in the term of frequency, and we give them the chance to um, uh, write the frequency of their practices. Then we have the section of barrier needs and future steps where we ask them what uh, so sources uh, would find more beneficial uh, at their organization, what barriers they face, uh, what training methods they prefer. And finally, the general questions about demographic, professional background and uh, facility information. 
Finally, we have included questions about training and how they informed about uh, uh, antibiotics or other things in their uh, routine life, because we believe that this will show uh, how people would like to be trained. We are finalized. We have finalized uh, uh, the first draft of the questionnaires. Uh, we are going to pretest English version Monday to. Uh, Wednesday, and I will upload the PDFs um, in uh, Tuesday. Uh, we are going to translate the questionnaires into Spanish and Greek and uh, back translation in English in order to perform uh, pilot testing. We believe that uh, after the three days we are going to um, complete the English version with a, a colleague of us that it is a native speaker. We need two weeks for the translations, two weeks for the pilot testing, one week to correct after the pilot testing, and um, until the end of November we will be ready uh, for, uh, uh, to deliver the final questions to IT services. Pilot testing is going to be in Spain and Greece. We believe that one participant from National Authority, ten participants for the fruit uh, production, two participants from antibiotic manufacturers, Two participants from water, uh, wastewater management and two from health sectors is enough for the pilot testing. After, this, after the pilot testing, the question is going to be translated uh, in uh, countries takes part in the task six. The questionnaires will be digital and, and uh, it is more easy to disseminate them and to collect the responses. Uh, and to have quicker access to the data management. Uh, we are going to um, develop uh, the database for, uh, for recording these responses. And the samples will be collected using convenient sampling method through the stakeholders that uh, uh, we have in the task six. Uh, uh, each country will uh, distribute the questionnaires in their country. Um, and uh, then uh, we, they will have two weeks period to complete the questionnaire starting from the day of uh, distribution. We believe um, we, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our thoughts are about the sample size and how it will be the rate of responses, uh, if it will be low uh, or um, high, and if it will be difficult to engage all these selected stakeholders to participate. Um, if there will be digital uh, tools accessible for everyone, so maybe we must have hard copies too. And we believe uh, and we hope not to, uh, to there is language uh, diversity among the respondents and do not understand our questionnaires. Uh, next steps for us is to analyze the data we are going to gather from gap analysis and finally to prepare a comprehensive report summarizing all these results and the recommendations. Thank you. Hello. Hello, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. And we are going to continue with the work session. And uh, unfortunately, our next speaker uh, cannot be with us here in Madrid, but uh, she's online. I hope you could follow uh, in Poland uh, uh, properly the, the meeting so far. So please uh, uh, welcome uh, to Marta Varga that is going to uh, present the Subtask 6.3.2 existing and available training materials at national and EU level. So the floor is yours, Marta. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Uh, it's, it's, it's my, my, my only to be today. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll see, see, my see my screen. Can, is it, is it now? working now? Yeah, it's working. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. And so, so, um, I, hear I hear a lot of if, if I can manage, I can manage it, 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 it and do something, something to fix that, 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 I will be really grateful. Now it's, now it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. It's perfect. Yes, yes. Tiny, tiny bit of echo, echo but not more. So, so uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Marta, for, for the introduction. 
Um, um, I'm representing the, the National Public Health Center, uh, oh, sorry, National Center for Public Health and Pharmacy of Hungary. But here today, I'm speaking on behalf of the entire supply 6.3.2, uh, which is uh, which deals with identifying the materials uh, regarding AMR stewardship in the environment. Let me start by acknowledging our, our partners in that from Poland and, and from Germany. And most of all, acknowledge my colleague Abel Nemeth, who was absolutely the driving force behind this, these activities. I will share with you in a couple of, of uh, in a few, in the upcoming uh, few minutes. Uh, we are also indebted to, to Anne, or the, the task leader, because she was very helpful on forwarding this action and guiding us through the necessary steps um, under this, this sub So um, the objective of this the, the, the subtask uh, was to identify the relevant training materials both on, on the national and the international level. Uh, this uh, we could do with the involvement of project partners or the task partners uh, was to um, was was uh, the, the languages were English of course and the national languages of Hungarian uh, Polish and German uh, this is this is of course um, a limitation of our our uh, efforts but but I will come come back to that in a, in a minute so um, we, that, that was our main objective uh, to find those relevant training materials, which can give you uh, um, an insight on, on what, what's already out there and what else needs to be developed or covered. We have separated um, these training uh, materials uh, based on, on uh, the identified focus groups or target groups for, for training and try to identify what are the, the gaps in, in knowledge uh, which is uh, in, in the already available training materials and, and to identify what, um, if, if there's any trend visible based on, on the available data. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we have started with identifying the adequate search criteria. This is not, not as, as simple as it might, might seem. Uh, we went through several rounds of optimization of the search criteria First, um, uh, after a, a brainstorming with, with the, the sub task partners, we uh, we came up with a few versions. Then we we tested those with a with a preliminary search to see if they will serve the purpose, and then we we um, optimized further the, the search criteria to make sure that what we retrieve has has actual relevance to this sub task, and. Um, does not include um, those materials which would be covered uh, by other other uh, working groups uh, under this thematic area. You will see that there is still some overlap with with trainings provided to to animal um, health or human health providers. Uh, after the uh, the um, identification of the, the search criteria, the next step was the actual uh, literature search. So what we did we we searched uh, scientific databases, but also uh, just the Google search. Uh, we do those search criteria to identify any guidelines, learning materials, or, or training courses uh, which, which relate to, to the topic of, of this, um, this subtask. Uh, we have done this in parallel. So what we did is that all, uh, all three partners of the subtask have carried out the English language search to make sure that that we are um, we arrive to the same conclusions or the same same uh, results. And each of the partners did the same search with the same criteria search criteria in their own national language. Then we uh, compiled this this, um, this the search outcomes uh, in a predefined template. So every every partner was, was uploading their their uh, results in a predefined template, and then we uh, after the, the elimination of the duplicates and removal of, of sources which uh, just bear uh, uh, remote relevance to the topic, we, we end up with the final results. Um, 
the, the report on this uh, so far has been prepared. Uh, now the um, we have just received the feedback from our project partners uh, on, on the comments to this this report. So it's in the process of finalization, and, and uh, the final version will be shared through the shared drive uh, uh, shortly, probably in the course of next week. Uh, so uh, this gives an overview of, of the search terms we have identified. So what we tried to do was that the primary search term would be the one uh, containing AMR and, and any of its, its potential synonyms. Uh, we included uh, other, uh, those, those uh, mechanisms of resistance which are not um, antibiotic resistant, but and we've tried to have a, a bit deeper um, dive, including um, active pressures, including pesticides, uh, antiparasitics, or uh, cochlearostatics as well, and not, not just just um, antibiotics in the in the strictest sense. Um, the secondary search term was uh, was training, and and it. Uh, and its synonyms. So, as you can see, we um, we we did try to be exhaustive as far as possible to make sure that we we include everything that's that can bear relevance. And the third, uh, the tertiary search term was the one that addressed the the where, so or the or the theme or the topic um, of of the, the training. So. We identified different agricultural related areas, including um, animal husbandry or aquaculture, fruit, fruit, fruit or plant production, also house, uh, soil related, wastewater related, um, and, uh, and even, even uh, including um, nature and environment. Uh, we did include hospitals because we think um, hospital environment, hospital waste, hospital wastewater. Is also part of the um, the environmental compartment, even though there might be overlaps with um, with the, the human and animal health uh, initiatives guidelines. So, um, based on uh, the the results, were uh, for for simplicity and, and for uh, to be able to um, give, uh, have an overview of results. Uh, we have asked project partners to upload the, the findings into a, a template, which we developed, of course, together with uh, with our partners. Uh, it could include the um, the title and type of the publication, the date, publication date, uh, the main focus of, of the trainings, and um, uh, some of some of uh, other characteristics, including the length or uh, depth the target audience uh, and the form of, of the um, guidance or, or training. And we have also, uh, of course, we created the results with, uh, to remove uh, duplicates and also to remove those which, which uh, even though it came up through the search, but were, were not actually relevant to, to the topic. So this is, this is the first glance to, to what we found. So we, uh, after the duplication, we have identified 617 publications, uh, which, which were relevant to the, to the topic. Um, through the search, of course, we retrieved also scientific publications. Uh, we have collected those. I know there is a, a separate task that's, that's uh, working on that, but we thought once it was, was um, collected and might, might as well be shared. Um, what we found is that scientific uh, publications were, were mostly um, focusing on the presence of, of AMR, either, either uh, uh, antibiotic residues, um, pesticides, uh, or other, other potential um, uh, compounds which give rise to an anti uh, microbial resistance or uh, the resistance itself. And, uh, and uh, uh, potential removal uh, technologies, uh, not so much uh, uh, focusing on, on actual uh, uh, stewardship um, uh, components, so 
several of examples of that, especially in animal husbandry or, or um, other agricultural um, agricultural settings. Um, you will see in a moment that uh, while trainings uh, were rather lacking uh, in in addressing waste uh, waste management and waste water uh, operators, um, the scientific publications were uh, very often concerning uh, waste and, and wastewater treatment, especially treatment technologies with the aim to re remove uh, AMR reactions from, from wastewater. Uh, but mainly the, 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 the public scientific publications themselves were not about trainings, but they could serve as a baseline for uh, informing trainings in the future. So, um, looking at the, the date of these publications, it is very clear uh, that the environment aspect of, of AMR, so this bag of, of One Health, is uh, only has gone against real relevance in the, in the past uh, less than 10 years. Most of the, um, the identified uh, publications were from the last uh, six years, so it's it's very very recent, very uh, recent, and we've seen a surge after the COVID pandemic in these, these uh, publications, including the training materials. Um, there were a, a, a number of, of mostly mostly uh, uh, um, supranational or international organizations who had. Uh, highest number of resources available. I just listed a few for for your reference. Uh, the um, target audience of of the, uh, of, of the materials uh, we have identified were uh, were diverse, uh, but it's very clear that most of the, the publications available are addressing policy makers or decision makers. So the main aim is to assist policymakers in setting up stewardship programs, environmental stewardship programs, uh, starting from the local level, like uh, hospital operators and how to better treat um, hospital wastewater, up to the national level on how, how to address this problem on, on the national level. Uh, if uh, the next most uh, numerous group as a target group of, of the publications we have found, uh, the food producers, either either farmers or, or food production industry, and the farmers would be advised on uh, how to use um, uh, pesticides or antibiotics more more sustainably. Uh, there are um, a number of, 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 of documents also aimed at um, um, healthcare or or animal healthcare providers within the areas. There, the, the environment aspect would be highlighted on the, so, oh, there are many other sources which which um, which deal with, with uh, strengthening stewardship in the human health or the animal health, but this, these were materials which specifically focus on why this is important uh, from an environmental perspective. Uh, the, well, where we do see a, a gap, is, as I mentioned previously, is the, um, is the waste manager and the wastewater treatment plant operators. Most um, guides do not include them as a target audience unless it's um, a very general one uh, addressed to the, the general public. Uh, looking at the depth, of these trainings or the extent of these these trainings and materials that we have found, um, there were a few which were uh, which were basic. They have about these these categories you see here is is of course a bit arbitrary, but still we wanted to uh, differentiate between materials which are are most of them sort of an ad advocacy or awareness raising document, maybe starting from an infographic, from comprehensive trainings or guides which are which give a, an, an in-depth uh, information to the program 
yeah. and, and even, even methodological guidance. Uh, so as you see, the majority of the documents were, were fairly specialized, specialized and, and, and detailed. Uh, of course, between the categories of, of target um, groups and, and uh, the detail of, of level of detail provided by these guidelines um, were, were quite strongly associated. So. Um, the basic um, information was was usually targeted to the non scientific uh, uh, audience, even to the to the general public. Uh, even e e the, the second group, which we call associative, so it's a, a bit more in depth. Uh, that's that's also uh, really to the to the more informed uh, public. While the the detail detail materials you would usually target uh, either either specific uh, professional group or or policy makers, the the comprehensive materials were most often uh, guidelines or textbooks. This is this um, this figure is actually merging two different aspects, but both uh, of them uh, of a relevance to you. That's why we included them here. Um, first, uh, I would uh, like to highlight is that the number of in training uh, in person trainings um, were, were very very limited. Um, this might, of course, have have um, um, it might be also associated with the fact that that most of these these uh, trainings were conducted or developed uh, in the post COVID era, uh, uh, either in the uh, uh, um, pandemic years or after, so that's um, we do uh, as myself. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can uh, uh, also an indication if, if we want to turn towards online uh, options where, where possible. In my case, this is this is an obligation. I much rather be sitting with you in the room and at this this in person. Um, about. Um, Half of the half of the publications will give the fundamentals of the problem. So, introducing the problem of AMR in the environment, the relevance, the uh, how how uh, transmission occurs in the in the the environment, and what what are the uh, what are the drivers of this this process, uh, and uh, of the, uh, in within the guidelines, we see more more detailed uh, um, methodological uh, descriptions. Uh, the national, um, so most of the the, uh, um, uh, the documents received would be in English. From the national sources, even even the combined efforts of the three groups uh, only received fifty five uh, publications. So we cannot uh, from from this number we cannot really draw very uh, very clear conclusions. Uh, but um, what is what is clear that, that national level trainings are uh, the number of, of national level trainings or trainings available in national languages is is generally very low. While learning materials would be would be more readily available. Uh, so just to conclude, most of the um, uh, identified publications uh, were were. Different. The, the recent years, less than less than six years, uh, the level with literature uh, targeted uh, mostly policymakers, but also uh, also uh, uh, prescribers, uh, and very limited number of them uh, targeted waste management or wastewater uh, management professionals. This might change in the very near future. Unfortunately, I couldn't listen all the way to what was said this morning, so I don't know if it's been mentioned that um, the EU Urban Waste Treatment Directive, which is which is uh, foreseen to be adopted in the coming few weeks, is is actually requires countries to monitor AMR uh, in wastewater with a focus on removal rates. So the, the aim of this this uh, surveillance is actually uh, not only to, to survey uh, what is circulating um, in regards to to AMR. But mainly to to uh, demonstrate that the, the applied wastewater treatment technology is suitable for removing AMR from wastewater. So that would mean that 
uh, definitely the base water uh, sector would need uh, need uh, much more information, much more guidance on on this topic in the near future, so they can meet this obligation under the EU um, um, urban based water directive. Um, we have quite identified quite a number of, of um, detailed methodolog methodological guide uh, guidances. Uh, and, and most of them would be aimed at the specific sectors such as agriculture, not really embarking much on the uh, the on health approach. Uh, so these these are some of the gaps we have identified based on the, the available training materials. That there is no, but there is definitely a need to, uh, as as we do in Gemara in general, to be embarking more on the the one health uh, um, context. And, and apply a multi-sectoral uh, approach to, to develop guideline and training development. And here are our project partners, and I would like to thank all of them for uh, for their efforts in in uh, in, in uh, developing this this uh, report and and their inputs for for the subtask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta. Very interesting uh, topic. Now we are going to move forward uh, to the next subtask. I want to introduce to Fernando Trujillo, is the expert at, at Conecta 13, which is <laughs> the, the company. I would like to express also um, um, the, the need of having external expertise in this topic because we are going to uh, well, he's gonna talk about. I am not because I am, I am veterinarian. <laughs> so, no, no, I cannot. I cannot do it. Definitely, <laughs> explanation of innovative learning. Um, I think your your view is very valuable for us because, uh, yeah, uh, we need to learn a lot on how to to, to train people. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for existing, because we really, really need you. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not a vet, certainly, I think, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, any of your professional roles. I'm an educator. <laughs> not so tall an educator, okay? And, uh, <laughs> And uh, so this is something like a break, okay? Forget about a, um, a AMR for a few minutes, okay? We are going to talk about education and learning. Then we should go back to the topic, okay? So this is the title of this 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes speech, exploration of innovative learning. And uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you we are really, really thankful for being here, for having the opportunity to learn from and with you. It's true that we have been working on health uh, for many years now in my uh, group because we have been cooperating with the Andalusian School of Health. And uh, this is such an important topic at the moment that we really felt that it's the place to be. And the, and the project to be involved with. So we are really thankful for the, for the invitation. And by the way, thanks to Anna for her kindness and all her support until we have arrived here. And uh, f fortunately, the weekend is coming, Anna. So, <laughs> so the question is, why is it important to talk about learning when we have so many other important topics? Uh, we have waste management, we have farms, we have everything. And then we go down to talk about learning. Why is it important? And what does learning really mean? Well, in fact, the number of scientific publications which end with the conclusion that we should improve education and learning concerning AMR and AMS is so overwhelming that we really feel that talking about education and learning at least for 30 minutes may be justified. 
to prove that that is true, we have brought some quotations, okay? You know, I belong to the University of Granada. I'm a, uh, a professor there, and um, our salary depends on the number of quotations we use, okay? So, three, four quotations, okay? Very, very urgently. This is all of them 2024, okay? The barriers and facilitators of AMS are well described in the medical and vet sectors in Australia. We are going to move around the world to see how worldwide a topic this is. Lack of awareness and knowledge and lack of access to education and expertise have been found to be key barriers. Then we travel, uh, and in this case to uh, Europe, to Europe, our study also suggests the potential value of practical measures to enhance AM stewardship, these concepts so terribly impossible to translate. I agree with you. Uh, the person who thought of stewardship as the word to use was not thinking in a multi-lingual uh, approach to it. So to enhance AMS in vet practice, such as improving vet education on the importance of minimizing treatment duration and so on. A third one, vets' antibiotic prescribing decisions are influenced not only by clinical elements and official, and official treatment guidelines, but also by a set of unwritten rules resulting from social interactions with their peers. This is one, a very fascinating uh, paper. All these papers are available for you if you want to take something for you to read on the plane back home. I can uh, send it to you right now. Efforts to influence good use of antimicrobial microbial related practices should consider peer interactions and the influence of social groups to promote MAU -MA reduction. And then fourth one, the professionals who did not participate in any continuing education programs were most likely to misuse the use of antibiotics in animals. And the last one, I promise, the development of farm guidelines, protocols and policies and the promotion of educational training programs on prudent use of antimicrobials are crucial interventions to assist farmers. So every paper you read when it comes to conclusions, they mention education and they mention learning. But what is learning and what is education in this context? You know, with learning, we have a problem which is similar to love. We think we know what it is and that there is only one answer, but then Tinder came and we discovered variety, you know? Tinder is a professional, you know, I will explain it later, okay? <laughs> During lunch, okay? Well, they have told me about Tinder, okay? But I, okay, forget about that. Well, the problem is that learning may be something different from what we thought from our own learning experiences. We have all been learners and we have built a, a framework, a frame to understand what that thing was. But learning may be something bigger. We love using new Ugeri's approach to learning. Learning may be defined as processes which lead to change. That is learning. Processes which lead to change and which are not related to biological maturation or aging. You don't know about aging because you are very young, but with age there are changes. You will discover that in time. So, learning processes which lead to change. But change is also a very complex word. And it is not a straightforward concept. Because in fact, all learning may be understood as two different processes and three different dimensions, very briefly, okay? I don't want you to feel bored when we talk about learning and education. First, the processes. 
there is first an interaction, there is an interaction process between the learner and the surroundings, which may include people, may include objects, may include the environment. And then an inner mental acquisition and elaboration process. If those two processes don't take place, there is no learning. That's quite obvious. And then three integrated dimensions, which are cognitive, emotional, and social and societal. It seems so obvious, but sometimes, or in fact, on many occasions, we forget about perhaps one of these dimensions, and we call just for the intervention of the cognitive side, and we forget that there are emotional and affective layers involved in learning. And we are making the call to the professional and his or her knowledge, and we forget that that person also has emotions, and that emotions are related to learning and how that person is elaborating knowledge in his or her mind. And that creates at least four different types of learning. Four different types of learning, not one. The first one is when you know nothing about a topic, and then you incorporate data, you elaborate that data, and you create a new frame set, a new uh, creation in your mind to understand reality from the scratch. That actually does not really happen normally with adults, because we believe we know everything. We'll talk about that later, okay? In fact, with adults, normally we are talking about the second and third ways of learning. The second one, normally called assimilative, is when you have a framework and you incorporate new data. But the frame itself is not modified. It's only larger. The model is larger. And then we have the accommodative. And that happens when new data provoke a change in the framework. The framework is modified somehow, to some level. Because when the framework and you yourself gets really modified, changed forever, then we are talking about transformative learning. Obviously, the first one is not that useful for us, for you and me, because normally we are working with people who tend to have some sort of pattern, a mind scheme, a framework, the second one is much more useful because we need data to, uh, to implement new practices and to implement a policy. The third one is definitely the one we may need. And the fourth one is the one which changes reality. Now you can imagine that this is not just a slide with a description of four types of learning. It's also a scale of difficulty. The first one is easy to achieve. Provide new data if you detect a gap. If you have an information gap, insert new data into the system. That's all, quite easy, quite cheap. The fourth one is radically difficult. Radically difficult. So the question is not as simple as how to promote learning about AMR or AMS. The question that you want to face is how to get the right kind of learning for each profile and each situation in such a way as to ensure the most appropriate response to the MMR challenge. Not just any learning, but the right kind of learning. In fact, if we removed the AMR challenge, we could include every social challenge, maybe related to health, economical problems, whatever. We need the right kind of learning. 
So, the two research questions we have written down to start our analysis of innovative learning methodologies, which you may make use of, are what innovative learning methodologies can ensure that key professionals are adequately trained and sensitized to the impact of prescriptions and the role of the environment in the transmission and spread of different resistance determinants. And then, how can such learning generate deep, sustainable, because we really agree that sustainability, as you were saying this morning, is important, okay? deep, sustainable, and transformative change. We couldn't be happy if we stayed in the first step of that scale. We want to move on or move up, and we want to be on the second, try to reach the third, and at least touch the fourth one for a substantial number of people so that we can change our approach to AMR. The methodology we'll be using is a scoping review in which we will try to cover not only scientific papers, but also what it's normally called grey literature. Because as we have just seen in Marta's speech, most of the guidelines, most of the training materials are not strictly related to scientific papers, but they belong to grey literature. Guidelines written down by the large uh, health uh, institutions, by universities, by corporations, and so on. So instead of a systematic review, we're going to use, to use a scoping review to, to be redundant, to uh, open the focus, to open the scope of our review of literature on innovative learning methodologies adjusted to the to the profiles. This is perhaps the most interesting and at the same time the most boring slide I'm using today because it describes the way we are working. And uh, I hope you will trust that we can perform a scoping review. But to be transparent, it's necessary to go through it. We have defined the research questions. We have already established the inclusion and exclusion criteria considering the variables we are working with. We have already started the selection of the sources of evidence, which have, as you may imagine, include the main databases and also that gray literature I was mentioning, the creation of the search strategy, the screening of the data, and then the final selection of the text. We have already started with that. We started with the first database of more than 3,000 texts, and then we are coming down, down, down to texts which are really relevant for your, for your topic. And then the extraction and analysis of the data and the, pre the presentation of the results for you to start working, in fact. After we have that report, we will start a consultation exercise, which is definitely important if we want the report to be relevant for you and not to be just a general report which could be used by any type of project or any type of uh, institution. In that cons consultation exercise, of course, we will follow the guidelines that, in fact, you tell us to follow. And now, Reality, this is the disclaimer. Adults are rather skeptical about everything that others want them to learn and which they themselves do not feel an urge to learn. And that's why we have problems in real life. Because in fact, adults do not really want to learn more than they know and nothing they don't feel they, the urge, which is a beautiful uh, word, easily understood by Latin languages too, because we have in many of our languages that root, urge, urgency. Adults is a difficult target, very difficult, because if not, we wouldn't have many of the problems we really have. Because in fact, adults are always weighing the effort and the benefits of learning. 
because we as adults have learned how difficult it is to learn and change. And we have learned from experience that changes may cause problems, difficulties, strange, difficult, awkward situations. And that's why the, we have that resistance to change and we transfer that resistance to change to a clear, let's say, skepticism about learning. This is a quotation by Michael Fulham, which is a worldwide educator, a, a well-known educator. When we try something radically new, there are immediate and practical, and practical losses, while the potential benefits are longer term and theoretical. It's true that in this case, they are not theoretical. They are well described in the literature. But in some occasions, at least as far as the literature we have been reading, many people consider them to be long term and they prefer some short term benefits. So the risk here of having skeptical adults is totally uh, clear, real, and present in your challenge. So, since this is asking too much, we need very strong social pull factors. And this may, and this may be one of the key concepts we wanted to, to bring to the floor today. Very strong social pull factors. That may be one of the keys of our project. How do we create those very strong social pull factors? I don't have the answer, obviously, because we are starting the project and we have four years ahead, isn't it? Four years. Three years. Three years. If we had the answer on the first year, we could stop, give back the money and, and go home. But we need three years to find the answer, in fact. However, and just to finish, and I, wouldn't, I will not consume the 30 minutes uh, I have, but I wanted to leave to leave with a, a brush of optimism. This is a very well-known book titled Professional Capital. The, the capital theory, which starts with Pierre Bourdieu, described our way of uh, trading our capacities and competencies in, in markets through the use of this capital concept. We have linguistic capital, we have family capital, we have many different types of capital. And, with, and when Andy Hargraves and Michael Fullan describes professional capital, they come to this conclusion. People are motivated by good ideas linked to action. They are further stimulated by taking action with others not alone, not even in silos, as Martha was telling this morning. They are further driven by learning from their mistakes. It's quite curious that adults, in general, prefer committing mistakes and then trying to solve them than being told what to do straight away. And finally, they are propelled by actions that have an impact. And in the project, in this section of the project, we will have to prove this is true. We'll have to create good ideas linked to action, not in the vacuum. We will have to stimulate real people to take action with other real people. We will have to drive them to try those good ideas and see the results of that implementation. And finally, we will have to prove the impact of that implementation. Well, I hope you will be successful. Uh, we will try to help you, but it's so important that you are successful. I wanted to finish with this open uh, quotation. There is not just one future, but many possible futures. It depends on our present actions, which future will become reality. I hope that through education and learning, we really improve how to face AMR and we really get to know how to promote stewardship 
and uh, finally learn how to translate it into many other different languages. So, thank you. Thank you. Let me remind you of the Padlet because we have a round table after lunch, okay? I know that you will invest the, the lunch time sending questions so for the round table, but remember the Padlet we created. We need those questions. Yeah. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, a very good teaser. Uh, I, I will, I will, I expect, uh, and I am looking forward to read this uh, uh, wonderful report you are building with your team. So, thanks. Uh, now we move forward to our uh, wonderful co-leads uh, in the task and in the package as well. So, uh, please welcome to Lida Politi and Leonidas Giorgialis. They are going to drive the question and answer session, so the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you Marta. Thank you. Thank you. So, once again, welcome all to this wonderful workshop and thank you very much, Annie and all of the colleagues for uh, creating this and organizing this for all of us. So, you have spent quite some time from this morning breathing in information. So, what we would like you to do now is breathe out through this Q&A session. So, we should start, perhaps? Yes, well, I just want to make a, a comment uh, based on what we saw so far. I think that uh, uh, preparing the training material would not be so easy as, as, as I thought at the start. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, so actually we have some questions. They are like general questions. Some of them are like multiple ones, and then there are some open-ended questions. Uh, Yeah, so actually the first part will be to respond the open questions that will be submitted uh, in the third uh, channel. And the second one, as you see here, is to conduct an internal survey among the, all the uh, 6.3 task participants in order to collect the feedback on the next steps. And this includes uh, mainly the 6.3.4, which is the preparation of the training materials. So uh, this is the QR code for the open questions. Uh, so if you haven't done it so far, you can uh, scan it. <coughs> yeah, you can take your time. And we promise we will not take time from your lunch. <laughs> or at least we will try not to. <laughs> Okay, and this is for the second part. This is the QR code for the survey. Okay, there will be sharing the responses. Okay, so this is the first one. Okay, so the first one is uh, the later stages on the gap analysis to the 6.3.1 partners regarding the last stage of the gap analysis. Could you please clarify how will the analysis of responses be conducted? Can we have a microphone? Do you have a microphone? Please. So will the university analyze all uh, the questionnaires? To, to the or will each institution analyze the responses of the questionnaires distributed in their countries? Well, um okay. Uh, that analysis will be performed from the UDH, but, but we will need help on the translation of the open que que ended questions. But then uh, each country will must interpret, uh, interpret the um, results of the study uh, uh, for their countries because uh, they're the most appropriate to do so. And then we can uh, uh, gather all these and uh, have the recommendation, the, um, uh, the um, I'm sorry. Final the results. Final results. But we will do the analyze because it is uh, questions with uh, uh, points. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will need uh, help both on the open-ended questions. 
-hmm. So, is there anyone else? It's okay? Great. So, uh, this one is for Ricardo Carapeta, I suppose. From Ricardo Carapeta, sorry, to Marta Varga. Which is the difference between training material and learning material? So, I think Marta was online. Yeah. Is or maybe Fernando Trujillo could ask this one? Maybe he knows. I <laughs> Oops. Oh, she's not connected anymore. Okay. So perhaps we could address this via an email and perhaps she could respond. Right, so moving on to the following question on training design and dimensions of learning. Uh, how can we get to understand the emotional and social societal dimensions of knowledge regarding the various target audiences? So this is addressed to Fernando Trujillo. This is such a good question. Uh, in fact, there are there are some papers who are really analyzing now that question. For example, the one we mentioned is very interesting because uh, it, de it describes how less experienced vets are more influenced by more experienced vets' uh, suggestions concerning prescription than guidances from policymakers or major institutions. So they receive the, the, the guide and the guidance and they say, that's okay. And they ask the, uh, the more experienced, sometimes older vet, okay, what do you normally do? I do this and that. And perhaps that person is less updated than certainly the guide or the person who's asking the question. That's what we mean by those social influences which are to be taken into consideration because it doesn't, it may, I wouldn't say it may be irrelevant, but, but it may be quite fruitless if we create more and more and more guides, but we don't enter into the community <coughs> relations between senior and junior vets in the case of that uh, profile sector, okay? So, it's, it's true, it's not easy. We will try to search for research for researchers and papers to answer most of the questions many of them are not to be answered because we don't have that piece of information so we we cannot access uh, emotional uh, facets emotional layers and social layers from every profile that you have detected on the first task of this uh, uh, project but we'll try our best to answer as much uh, questions, as many questions as you as you may ask, okay? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Fernando. So, no, you need to keep the microphone because you have one more question well, from... I think, <laughs> I think we, have, we have a comment in the back. You have a comment? Probably. Please, uh, then use the microphone and back to Fernando. Sorry, I don't know if we can make follow-up questions or not. I think it's a safe environment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have a follow-up question. You mentioned the sample of veterinarians, and uh, yeah, uh, as a veterinarian, uh, I, I work more or less aware. But is the same for human health and other sectors? Have you found any, or do you have experience about the difference between new professionals and all experienced professionals in other sectors? Thank you. I'm really happy to receive difficult questions <laughs> right at the beginning of the project, okay? <laughs> Keep some of them for the fourth year, please. Uh, well, our experience with, uh, with the health sector may lead to similar possible answers, but we don't have data yet to say yes or no to, to your question. But I think it's one of the routes we may follow. The difficult point is not to find out if senior vets or doctors or nurses or whatever may have an influence on junior vets, which is quite logical in a community, uh, from a community uh, uh, structure, okay? Systems work like that. 
The problem is how to create a training uh, material, how to create a, a learning experience which may modify a community structure. That is the challenge, okay? How can we do that? And uh, there are some experiences, we all know concepts such as community of practice and so on, but it's quite a challenge, okay? That's why the disclaimer, okay? Because it's not easy to modify the power relations and seniority and expertise is a power relation uh, so that we may empower the junior to be able to say or to, or to reply the senior that perhaps there are new ways to do this, okay? So it's quite a challenge, okay? And sorry, but we don't have data for all the profiles that you have defined, which is quite a long list, yes. okay? <laughs> Thank you. One more yep. follow up. Thank you. Uh, so then I understand that uh, during the process of development of the training material, we should uh, look for as much as, as much engagement as possible from all the invo involved sectors, because maybe the health sectors are more close to everybody in the room. But as uh, I said at the beginning, the, 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 the environmental part, we are not so aware how do they behave. Um, then your idea is to before starting to develop the, the training material to understand uh, uh, those uh, other sectors, or they should be involved in the, in the process of developing the uh, training material, which would be your, your view. And by the way, thank you for the presentation. It was very funny and also very uh, uh, illustrative. Uh, so thank you very much. For the online people, yes, please. In fact, l learning implies engagement. The, your question, as I have understood it, is whether engagement should be prior to learning in the moment of uh, instruction design. Is that so? I would say that it's always much better to have engagement in instruction design. We can take a sample, we can invite them. Uh, but in fact, it doesn't really matter because whatever you create, you need to have engagement as a focus, as a, as a real objective. Because engagement implies those three layers we discussed. The cognitive, which is fundamental. If we don't understand, it's impossible to implement any type of uh, complex policies. And your policies are very complex because it implies talking to engineers, such as Jairo, and talking to doctors and biologists. So there is complexity in the, in the policy. Without the cognitive uh, side, there is no understanding and problems will arise. But, if there is, but engagement also implies emotions. Let me bring it to, a, to, a, to an example. If, uh, if a training process uh, pictures the learner as, a, as an agent, uh, it may facilitate that that agent creates something. And uh, creating artifacts is a way of promoting uh, engagement. For example, you create the most beautiful guide against uh, or concerning AMR and to promote a stewardship. And you send the guide everywhere. People will receive the guide and you know what they do, okay, with the guide, okay? <laughs> they read it to their children uh, at night, okay? Dear children, this is what we should do. But then, you take the guide, and then we start a process in which, from the guide, we have to do something, create artifacts, and we may consider, I, I will use uh, grassroots examples, okay? Not very sophisticated yet, okay? Because 
we must learn the type of things you can do, okay? But imagine creating a podcast uh, in which senior vets read the guide and tell junior vets what they should do through a podcast. Creating an artifact create, uh, provokes engagement because there is a process of knowledge elaboration. So it's not only whether there should be engagement in the process of instruction design, but also what type of training we are going to offer and how that training creates engagement, okay? And it, will, it may depend, okay, on the image we have about the learner. If the learner is a receiver, then normally engagement is very low. If the learner is an agent, and we are talking about professional development, we are, to we are working with professionals, okay? If we foresee that they are agents who can do things, do is a very general verb, I know, we must find out what do may mean in each case, okay? Then we may try to provoke that sort of engagement that we need so that uh, there is commitment to action, okay? Not only willingness to receive new information. Oh, now these, these are the, 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 the guidance we should follow concerning uh, AMR. Okay, let's follow them. Uh, that's very superficial, okay? Receiving information. We need to, I think we, we should, so far in this moment of the project, we, we might be optimistic that there may be ways of going a bit farther and provoke commitment to action, not only willingness to receive further information. Okay? It's complex, okay? Well, I'm, it may sound more or less funny depending on uh, how you tell it, but it's complex. This is a complex challenge as you may know so far. Thank you. So, Fernando, you have one more question from... <laughs> I think, yeah. Wow, playful tuna. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. which are the main factors that impact on the effectiveness of training material after being developed? Okay. Answering that question uh, qualifies you to become a full professor at any faculty of education. You know that, okay? <laughs> In fact, it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends because I think you have been very wise defining profiles, okay? Every profile you have defined comes from different, related but different cultures of learning. And uh, different cultures of learning have different ways of approaching learning. Engineers approach learning in a very different way to doctors and vets and many other professions, okay? And they people approach learning in different ways. So, even though I cannot see the question because it's so far for me, that the main factors are related to the people who are learning and to the culture of learning they come from and to the community they belong, okay? So we'll have to define that to, to, to guess what type of learning methodology may suit that cultural background, that cultural background and, uh, and uh, that uh, w way of approaching learning. So I'm really sorry I, I don't have the answer, but the answer is it depends. Same uh, something different is lying to you and the topic doesn't deserve lies okay if I would say this is the way it's not true yeah okay well don't worry this is why we're here to find the answers I know. You, don't <laughs> have, you don't have to have all the answers don't worry okay so Please. shall we proceed yeah. so the, we have a new entry but I'm going to address the former ones first all right so uh, how could our work provide with fundamental knowledge and guidance on the topics to the different target audiences, considering there is a big amount of literature and evidence, but still poor specific guidelines on best practices? Okay, so, who 
who would like to take up on that one. It's uh, addressed to the 6.3.2 partners. Okay. Wait for the mic, please. I will, I will try to answer these questions and maybe even the previous one that was addressed to Marta because we are in the same team. Um, so maybe I will start from the previous question. It was uh, the question about the difference between training materials and learning materials because yeah. it seems very similar. But um, we decided that we also uh, try to look for like trainings that were already prepared in the past both international and in the national level. And uh, so training materials are basically trainings that were already developed. And learning materials, this is like all materials that will be useful when we will be preparing like new adjusted trainings. And uh, this is also connected with the, another question. It was uh, the question about gaps that were found, um, we noticed that even we found uh, multiple trainings that were already developed, and uh, there is an issue either with the access to these training materials, because it is often like restricted to some groups, especially in Poland or even in, uh, at an international level, uh, it was a problem to uh, access these materials or if they were available and they were dedicated for uh, like narrow groups of people or for healthcare. So like um, these were not like specific materials that we are like looking for. And there was also another question about the gaps and uh, considering the gaps uh, that we found during the literature, uh, literature uh, search um, there was practically um, no materials uh, dedicated to uh, wastewater management. Like there were literally like a few uh, when compared to when compared to the other uh, groups that we are targeting. And we also during the search we uh, included like the grey literature because this was also the question. So. Um, even if the trainings were available, they were uh, often like trainings that um, we um, couldn't find information when they were developed, by who, based on what literature. So um, these were um, like not full information available. And finally, to answer your question, Anna, um, <laughs> if it comes to our like um, impact, maybe, and the direction we should follow. Um, I think that maybe developing like specific guidelines to uh, these target audiences, it would be like the best approach. Um, because there are like uh, a lot of documents that have like the same general knowledge and uh, the information that are overlapping, but they are like not specific. So. Uh, maybe for us it is like a material useful, but not for the target audiences. So I think that uh, this will be the right direction to start. Wow. Thank you very much for Thank you very answering much. all these you questions. You answered the all time. of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that we can go to one more uh, addressing Fernando. Uh, how can uh, we get engagement of trainees when the benefits are not for them? Uh, socially, uh, I think, uh, society benefit, not immediate or not measurable? Well, in fact, I think that partially I, I tried to answer that question before. Mm, you may have long-term engagement because mm -hmm. you are really concerned about the results of the outcomes of your learning. That happens <coughs> sometimes, but it's much more effective to have short-term engagement through the design of the learning materials and uh, through a specific techniques and, and, and the design decisions that you may use. Which decisions? That's what, what we must learn through the project and this first part of the, of the project. And how to adjust these to the sectors, how to fill in the gaps that you have discovered, how to enrich all these guides that you may write which are 
which may be sector uh, finely tuned, uh, and then enrich that with the appropriate experiences, learning experiences, so that the guides may become alive in, in, in actions, and in implementation of real measures. So that is the, the, the path we should follow. So small steps will take us a long way eventually, yeah, that's right? It, that's it. And it's a matter of trial and error, correct? That's it. Yeah, good. And one final question. So how do you see the impact of, bench of a benchmarking system where farmers are forced to take some training in case they do not meet expectations? Is, that, is this a pull factor? Ooh, who would like to take upon that one? Fernando? Yeah, it's actually, it's like 6.3.3. <laughs> Uh, you're going to earn your yeah, lunch today. You have today. dominated the <laughs> For the sure. I hope lunch is not sandwiches, okay? <laughs> I don't know, Annie? <laughs> no, 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 I trust Annie 100%. Uh, I don't know, really. Uh, I must be sincere. I'm not a farmer, and uh, yeah. we haven't uh, been able to enter into each specific uh, uh, sector so as to say something reasonable evidence-based and, and uh, at the level of your project. So I, I cannot answer this question. Really, really sorry. Yes, please. Of, <laughs> of course, I don't have an answer, but uh, we can share with you an experience that was developed here in Spain with the National Action Plan uh, with farmers to reduce the consumption of colistin. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, the focus was not not uh, forge, force people or uh, you know, put mandatory uh, rules, but everything was based on being a volunteer. Uh, understand that uh, it was a benefit for everyone and for the whole society and also for their own farm. So uh, it was a lot of work from our colleagues in the National Action Plan, but it was a volunteer program and the reduction, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, Carmen, went down dramatically. So. Sometimes forcing is not the best approach. Please, yes. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks for all your, the information. And we have uh, such a huge work. And just to contribute to this question and adding some information for my personal, um, I don't know, Information or experiences. Uh, I don't think that uh, forcing the farmers could be, uh, or give it a guidelines, could be a, a good direction. I think that more practical and let's uh, contribute to all uh, information and activities could have more uh, more effect because they are like uh, they need solutions. And they need uh, to see that other kind of uh, options are available, and we are working to give them other options. So not only to force that this is not uh, um, to use or whatever, just more practical, and they uh, be part of this work. So um, I don't know, make feel them that they are really uh, an important part of this circle. I think this this could be the yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, I agree exactly. with you. Exactly, exactly, thank you very much. And our tiny, tiny remark is that when you force something, you, uh, you are asking for a reaction, and usually this reaction is uh, not nice, let's call it that. So it would be much more easier to stand beside them instead of against them and ask them exactly what are the, barrier, the barriers and why they are not willing to take the training, then you actually understand what the problem actually is and you're taking uh, them uh, with you along the way. So it's a matter of 6.4 oriented actually question about the behavioral change strategies. So this is why we should also not work in silos and collaborate with other tasks. Yep. Yes, please. <laughs> Just because I raised the question, the experience we are making in Germany is completely different. Mm -hmm. Because always, because we have that benchmarking system and we are forcing the farmers to do something. 
And only if we are forcing the farmers, we get really a dramatic reduction of antimicrobial uh -huh. use. Mm -hmm. And as long as we stop to force them, they go back to what they did ever. So it will be interesting, and this was the reason, the reason why I asked the question, what do we have to change in our communication and learning strategy to also achieve something on a voluntary basis? Because I think that was one of the messages that we need to understand better how to do it, that they do it on their own. Because at the moment, they do not see any benefit for them. It's no profit for a farmer. It's a lot of extra forces, a lot of workload, but they do not get extra money, so they are in an economic pressure. So I think this is for something I'm happy to learn and to see how, how we can improve the strategy because it does not work like in Spain mm. at the moment, my impression. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, going back to the to the uh, survey, uh, just a question for Joanna and, and colleagues, as you're uh, way more experienced on your on your experience, um, uh, which is or which can be or can be expected to be the effect of the bias uh, induced by the, the the questionnaire. If you have any experience on that, and also another um, a practical question on uh, on the pilot testing that you are foreseeing, um, if it will be taking the, the questionnaire. Uh, for some selected stakeholders to be answered or some selected stakeholders to review the questions, which is your, um, uh, your idea, so those two questions. Thank you. Um, if I understand why we exclude the titles of the, uh, for the bias, why we don't, do not... Uh, no, no, no. Yes. Uh, if uh, someone knows, yeah, um, some questions may lead you to answer them. Um, if it is about knowledge, they might think uh, twice what to, what they have to answer and to, uh, to choose uh, not what they know, but uh, maybe they will search in the internet or on uh, practices what they have to do, not what to do. Uh, uh, in uh, real uh, life. And that's why uh, Professor Mukturi preferred this way of questionnaires, not to lead them uh, to what we are asking for. Uh, as for the pilot uh, testing, we think uh, that we, will, we want um, uh, to be answered to the questionnaires. So, because we, we, we want to see if someone, if uh, a questionnaire is uh, only for um, on only for the um, scoring uh, table, then something must change. Uh, the question, the form of the question, not to be uh, to be negative, uh, uh, not to lead uh, the answer of the questions. So uh, we are like two minutes from lunch and we have not shared the second yeah. poll. Well, actually, we had a, a plan to yeah. share some other questions, like multiple choice ones. Um, I think that even though we don't have time, maybe we could uh, scan it and you can answer them later during lunch or after, yeah. because maybe we can use this kind of information in the future. Um, to prepare for the future steps in the project yeah. and also to get some information of how you think that project is going along so far. So we are a democratic group, so it's totally up to the majority if you want to revisit the results of this poll after lunch, perhaps. Yeah, but but it, we, we have to be uh, good and uh, we have to be right uh, against the other uh, presenters. So it will be totally up to yeah, well, everybody, see. what Maybe everybody we can, decides. We can send them by email yeah. and uh, then we can discuss it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. So Have thank you nice very lunch. much. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Your well-earned lunch. Given some clues about the table, the contents of the table, and how we have worked to be here today. 
We also have a presentation, of course. <laughs> okay. You thought we, we didn't have a presentation? Yes, we have. Okay, so welcome to the round table. It's a very humble uh, round table. Discussion and exploration of needs, preferred methodologies, and potential approaches to enhance educational outcomes. Give a solution to that and you will be able to rule the world, okay? Well, first of all, our idea is to be together. Not just to bring together, but to be together because we strongly, we firmly believe that being together and talking together, we are wiser and we can reach more interesting ideas for us <coughs> to think about and to use in our project. So in that being together, we will try to promote that exchange of knowledge and perspectives. The four <coughs> key points that we will uh, try to face today are the understanding of the influence of each sector on the spread of AMR in the environment, to explore existing practices and initiatives as well as future commitments of each sector, to discuss the challenges and obstacles, <coughs> uh, and, and obstacles, sorry, and obstacles that sectors face in promoting antimicrobial stewardship, and finally to examine the potential benefits of a training intervention and inform its design. Today we'll be uh, listening to three different sectors and three different experts, antimicrobial manufacturers, wastewater managers and community pharmacists. And now allow me to, introdu to introduce the, uh, our stars today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arancha Sancho, as you may read, is the director of the medical scientific department in the Spanish Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry, normally known as Pharma Industria, and she holds a degree in medicine and surgery from the Autonomous University of Madrid and a PhD in pharmacology. So I think she's a real expert in the topic we are studying uh, today. She has ex extensive experience both in uh, research and regulatory affairs, apart from medical practice, and the number of committees, boards, and other complex situations she has been involved with uh, allows her to be here and to talk to us. And uh, as she's the first one I introduced, allow me also to, to thank them for the effort of being here, because one is always... Uh, the time is always scarce to prepare these sort of um, situations and then in English and then with very difficult questions that we have prepared for them because we are bad people in general. So you'll see the questions are really, aren't they? Very difficult. And then we have Jairo Gomez and he is the representative from Wastewater Managers and uh, she, he works uh, at the operation and maintain as a as an operation and maintenance technician and research, research development and innovation manager at the <coughs> Wastewater and Waste Management Consortium in Navarra, in the north of Spain. And he holds a PhD in industrial engineering, which is a very good example of how multidisciplinary this uh, challenge requires us to be. And his PhD is from the University and, of Navarra, and his Doctoral uh, thesis is on self-sustained thermophilic aerobic digestion of sludge. <coughs> and uh, I only understand prepositions in that uh, title. <laughs> and I had to search for the term sludge uh, because I have never used sludge. I hope you will be able to explain what sludge is. He has been working at Navarra, uh, the Infraestructuras <coughs> Locales, uh, NILSA, as the head of research and, and development. So over 20 years of study, research, and practical uh, development, practical uh, implementation considering urban water and sludge uh, treatment, whatever sludge is, of course. <laughs> and uh, Ana Molinero, she is the first vice president of the Spanish, the Spanish Society of Clinical Family and Community Pharmacy. She is a community pharmacist, which is very important. And uh, I think that that 
underlies everything she has done during her <coughs> career. Because as a community pharmacist, she's also uh, written her PhD in pharmacy. She is a specialist in clinical analysis. And we think that that is another point added to the, to the round table. And she also has a teaching perspective because she is working as, a, as an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Alcalá. So I think that three very complementary and interesting profiles for us to face <coughs> complex questions. B, uh, I, I feel thankful for them, but I, uh, I also feel uh, empathetic and sympathetic for them because it's been an effort to be here. Uh, we told them what we wanted to discuss uh, with not that much time to, to prepare, and they have made a real, real great effort. So, what about a round of applause for her to say <laughs> thanks? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs> now, we have a Padlet, do you remember that? Okay, so questions in the Padlet. Questions uh, for Fernando Trujillo are not allowed now, please remember that, okay? <laughs> Only for the experts. So we have the Padlet and your participation is expected and welcome. And if there is any other, is there any other important message I should convey, Marta, Anne? No? So let's start with the, with the round table. We have some time allocated for each of them and uh, we will uh, start with uh, questions uh, for Arancha, then we'll move to Jairo and finally Anna. And you will have the questions on the screen. But they are free to answer the questions from not only from their perspective, but with the approach they have chosen, sometimes reducing the scope of the question, <coughs> sometimes focusing on a special case. So. The question is more a guidance, a, guidance, a suggestion, than a, a compulsory uh, way of making you talk in any way, okay? So, you will see that the round table is organized in four blocks, which are repeated once and again. And we wanted to start with knowledge and attitudes. And uh, the organizing committee thought that these three questions were interesting for the, pharma the pharmacy industry. So these are the questions we suggested to, to Arancha. <coughs> what is the pharmaceutical industry, industry's understanding of the environmental implications of AMR? How does the industry position itself in addressing these challenges? And how committed you think is the pharmaceut pharmaceutical industry to innovation and uh, regulatory compliance. Okay, so Arancha, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fernando. You're and welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a challenge, indeed, <laughs> 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 because this is not my area of expertise, but I have learned a lot, and mm -hmm. I take this as an opportunity to start working together and to have more uh, opportunities to, to discuss uh, and mm -hmm. know from each other. So. Um, the answer, my answer to the three questions could be yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but you told me that I have to elaborate a little yeah. bit. <laughs> perhaps a little bit, yeah, perhaps a little bit. <laughs> yes, thank you, or something like that, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yes, thank you. And yes, of course, the industry is uh, well aware of the problem in general. Uh, I mean, the, the, the discharge of um, active pharmaceutical ingredients to the environment for any kind of medicinal products is, is a concern, a relevant concerns, mm -hmm. and we understand that we have a responsibility there, and of course we want to play a, an active role in, in, in addressing the problem. What concerns uh, antimicrobials, the problem is even higher because uh, the consequences have an impact on the public health, and, and so the commitment and the concern and the, um, is there mm -hmm. even more, uh, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, what are we doing? Um, Afterwards, per perhaps I will talk to you a, a little bit about a, a first mm -hmm. report we have a, a, we have a prepared and presented. But the idea uh, of this report, and I think this is the, the important point, is that um, most of our associates, we are working in pharma industry with the research-based uh, industry, mm -hmm. and most of our associates are um, already working under the principles of 
ECG, ECG mm -hmm. principles, which is environment, environment, social and governance principles mm -hmm. um, that are stated in, in the European directives mm -hmm. and they in, in somehow they are um, promoting a sustainable development for mm -hmm. any kind of industry or um, the company. Um, where of course we keep the benefits, the social benefits of what we are doing. In this case, we do medicines, and so mm -hmm. we are doing social benefits, which I think are unquestionable. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we, we, we have to reduce uh, the negative impact of what we are of offering the, the society. The, the negative impact, uh, in this case, of the <coughs> manufacturing, the supply, the distribution, and the disposal of medicines. And here is where we have a challenge, and we are already working on this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, of course, we are at different level in the different companies. I don't have a, a, um, an accurate uh, figure of okay. what is the situation, but the reality is that we have created a working group. Uh, we share our experiences. We have made a photo of where we are now. Okay. And this is what we presented yesterday. And the idea is to monitor that the, we all are mm. working in the right direction to reducing the negative impact of what we are doing and offering the, the, the society. Specifically um, on the manufacturing side, which I think is the last question, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, yes, at the European level, um, the, we have created some standards for the manufacturing for every kind of medicinal product, mm -hmm. which are trying to establish principles and actions that can reduce really the impact of uh, um, the medicines uh, waste. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and we also have um, similar principles, <coughs> but specific for antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the problem is that still we don't have clear definitions, but at least we have made an effort uh, to try to define what could be concentrations without risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are trying to manufacture antimicrobials, uh, looking for um, not crossing that, uh, that border. And, and of course, this is a, an area where the knowledge is uh, yes, changing over time, and mm -hmm. we, are, we will be monitoring the knowledge and trying to update these guidelines and, and to mm -hmm. make, I mean, the best possible way uh, things, or the most, the most responsible way uh, uh -huh. things. I think it's quite clear that knowledge and attitudes, <coughs> when you can prove that you have created a group, that, that you have established that threshold risky threshold not mm -hmm. to go through. I mean, that's uh, proving the attitude and that's implementing uh, actions based on evidences and knowledge. Now we would move to practices and real practices in the, in the pharmacy industry. And the question is, how does the pharmaceutical industry address the manufacturing of antimicrobials that yeah. are inherently persistent in the environment, as I think Hilo will comment on the, the persistency of those antimicrobials and what specific initiatives or partnerships is the pharmaceutical industry involved in to reduce the environmental impact of antimicrobial production. You have mentioned that European group, yeah. but I'm sure there will be another one. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> probably this is not an exhaustive list. But sure. There are many initiatives around because it's true that when I started just looking <laughs> around, I found a lot of uh, associations and groups, but groups. But I before mentioned um, this uh, European initiative uh, that is called the AMR uh, Industry Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, those working on this uh, manufacturing uh, manufacturing standards for antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a jo joint effort of different uh, life science uh, industries, not, not only um, mm -hmm. research-based industry. They are, there are also generics, diagnostic, biotech, all kind of companies. Mm -hmm. And they are working, um, those are th the ones working on these uh, uh, guidelines and following the, how is the, the problem. Any company that wants to join uh, this alliance, they have to adhere to these requirements and, and there is a way, um, there is also a kind of certification by, by a third party I think is uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking for that you are already adhering to the requirements uh -huh. and that you are having an impact so they are also checking what is the outcome of this uh, of these uh, recommendations mm -hmm. I think there is another initiative which I think is quite important and that is uh, being conducted or performed here in Spain which is uh, the SIGRE um, mm -hmm. um, this is um, 
an integrated system for the management of uh, medicines waste. Mm -hmm. uh, how to say, but it's from the Spanish terminology. It's a very good translation. <laughs> this is, I, I'm sure you will talk about it because you are closely involved. Uh, this is a, a non-profit organization, but it's a, uh, was led by the pharmaceutical, um, the community pharmacies, the, the um, generic industry, if I recall well, uh, the, aso the, the trade association of the F um, generic industry, mm -hmm. the trade association of the research-based ba <coughs> industry, which is a uh, pharma industry, mm -hmm. and I think the distributing sector. I mean, um, and what they are doing is just a responsible, uh, disposal of medicinal products which are uh -huh. that are used in by the citizens uh, out hospitals uh -huh. uh, this was set in 2001 and is um, I mean working and improving and, and, and providing reports periodically to really see what is the, the impact of, <coughs> the, uh, of this initiative which I think is, is absolutely important and absolutely relevant they are moving ahead and trying to mm -hmm. have more impact and but I will leave this uh, to the second <laughs> to the other question. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I have some. If, if I, I mean, of course, there are dif different platforms uh, yeah. we are working on, like the One Health uh, platform mm -hmm. um, with the Spanish agency in the Pram, and so I mean. But uh, well, these are initiatives that are led by others somehow. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I hope that well known, they are well yes. known initiatives. Absolutely. And let's talk about the future then. Okay. okay. And <laughs> that's the section called next steps. Okay. So, what steps is the pharmaceutical industry planning to take to strengthen its environmental antimicrobial stewardship, which is different to uh, human and, and animals? So, we are focusing on the environmental yes. stewardship. And how does the industry plan to measure the effectiveness of these initiatives? Yeah. Because if you do not measure, the problem is that you cannot be sure where you are and where you want to be. Okay. It's true that I, I didn't mention, but I, I, focus, I was focusing all the time on human medicines. But of course, I mean, mm -hmm. veterinary medicines are critical. Okay. And indeed, they have made a huge effort to, to mm -hmm. reduce the use of antimicrobials, which I think is or could be the most impactful uh, uh, mm -hmm. action. But I was just <laughs> looking no, at, my, at my part. Yeah. Um, I have some notes just not to miss uh, the relevant. There is room for improvement, I mean, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think for the industry, they have clear what is the, the target, the <coughs> ultimate target, and then this is a long distance uh, run. race uh -huh. <laughs> or run. <laughs> uh, so we continue uh, the idea. I mean, I think what is important is that we are aware of the problem. Everyone wants to be part of this and not to be left mm -hmm. uh, behind. Mm -hmm. So this is good, and, and now there is a, um, I mean, there is a sens sensitivity that probably was mm -hmm. not in the past. So everybody, big companies, of course, but also small companies want to be there. Uh, within this alliance, yeah. European alliance, mm -hmm. it's more than a European, it's an international alliance of uh -huh. the industry that is working on antimicrobials. I think now the number of uh, companies is around 100. There are not many companies involved mm -hmm. in the antimicrobials uh, um, in the world, I think, but probably there are, there's, I think there is room for uh -huh. for more companies involving and adhering to, 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 to these standards. I think there is also a need to discuss further and, um, in, in more forums, uh, forum? uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like this um, with regulators, because <coughs> this is not a matter of uh, being working in parallel. Uh, I yeah. mean, we, we have to agree on what are the targets, what do we know, what, what are the, the expectations from the different mm -hmm. stakeholders and trying to go and work in the mm -hmm. same direction. Um, this is also relevant because, I mean, regulators, I mean, can go in a, the right direction. The ultimate goal be good, like um, what is being under discussion in the new legislation mm -hmm. and so on, and all the relevant directives on waste, uh, waste, uh, yeah, yeah, directive and so on. I mean, the, the ob objective is good, but perhaps <coughs> there could be untowards or unwanted effects. Uh -huh. uh, and and uh -huh. you have to know that. So it's important that we sit together and, 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 and discuss and see the implications of the actions that, that you are just proposing. proposing. Indeed, now we are a bit concerned with the discussions that are ongoing uh -huh. in the European legislation and so on, but we can discuss this a little, a little mm -hmm. later. On the SIGRE, I said before, there is a lot of room for improvement because we are collecting just a small part of what, of what we are distributing. Uh, mm -hmm. The hospital medicinal products are not within this uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
management of the, 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 the medicines uh, waste, and it will be incorporated in January, so mm -hmm. this is good. But perhaps we have to promote a little more between the citizens what mm -hmm. we have, that this is an opportunity to uh, reduce the impact that we have uh, uh, with medicines, and we, this is a co-responsibility with the citizens, mm -hmm. so it's something we have to push a little bit uh, in the future. When w I was preparing this, I was thinking, okay, <coughs> I joined pharma industry uh, eight months ago, and mm -hmm. in the past, apparently, there was a working group uh, working uh -huh. on the microbials that was now sleeping. Uh -huh. And I thought, no, 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 this is the time to wake this up <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because there is a lot of things to, to work on, and this is one. So um, I take this um, as a homework. And yeah, yeah. what are we doing more? Well, I think the most relevant activity is prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, to, if we really want to have an impact in an antimicrobial resistances. And for prevention, we have... Um, vaccines, mm -hmm. we, we, we continue uh, investing and in research, development of vaccines. It's mm -hmm. important. We work with the uh, authorities in trying to increase the coverage. If we are able to vaccinate and reduce the incidence of infections, mm -hmm. we will reduce the use of <coughs> antimicrobials and we will reduce all the problems around antimicrobials. So I think that's an important mm -hmm. an action. And I think that's all. Well, that's <laughs> I have some more notes, but I think... That's quite a lot. <laughs> and you have also assigned homework to yourself. Yes, so yes. So that's great. That's great. <laughs> Awakening that group. And, uh, but I was asking for other dialogue. So. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and so we finish with gaps and training needs, which is part of this 6-3 uh, point yeah. uh, task. And we have been discussing the gaps and, and uh, needs assessment that uh, they have been doing. And we thought of two questions for, for you and for Pharma Industria. What challenges does the pharmaceutical industry face in advocating for environmentally responsible practices, and including the management of antibiotic residue emissions? Mm -hmm. And what initiatives or resources do you believe might would enhance your sector's, your sector's uh, response to antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance? Yeah. What's your opinion? This is a bit difficult, but, but I will start with the challenges. And okay. the challenges now, uh, nowadays, uh, have to do with the, the, the changes in the legislation. Okay. Now we live with uncertainties because we don't know what it will be in the end, the outcome, uh, the, the actual wording of the legislation, what will be the requirements. I'm talking about the pharmaceutical package and how the environmental risk assessment, assessment for new medicinal products or new indications uh, will be, we mm -hmm. don't know. We know it will be extended, but we don't know the how much and in yeah. what terms. And this is a bit concerning because uh, what we have read so far, um, and here I can use my different hats because I was in the past regulator mm -hmm. and I haven't seen uh, never a case where the marketing authorization of a medicinal <coughs> product um, couldn't be granted because <coughs> an environmental risk, I mean, uh, uh, and this could happen, of course. I mean, if, mm -hmm. the, if this is a huge risk, because if that's where the case, then the benefit risk would be negative. And I think this should be a reason for not mm -hmm. granting a marketing authorization. But the current legislation includes other situations like um, an environmental risk assessment that you know is part of the dossier of a medicinal mm -hmm. product, where if it is incomplete or if it is a, a, a one of the risks has not, be, not been satisfactorily addressed mm -hmm. or um, um, the regulator is unhappy, that mm -hmm. could end up in, in um, refusal of the marketing authorization or a revocation or a suspension or a withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And wow, I think that's, that's too much because in the end we are talking about medicinal products. Yeah. I mean, so this could uh, really stop the access or, or compromise access to medicinal products mm -hmm. uh, for patients. And mm -hmm. this is also a problem, a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to balance what we are asking because of course we have risks zero, mm -hmm. but then we have to see what is the, the, the opposite. Mm -hmm. The same uh, holds true for the um, waste directive. I know a little bit, a little bit less <laughs> mm -hmm. about this part, but um, but at present there are a lot of uncertainties on how, uh, what will be the requirements, the tertiary um, treatment of the waters, the qu quaternary, whether it could be the, the third uh, treatment extended and that could be sufficient, or it will be a requirement for doing the ter tertiary and also the quaternary mm -hmm. um, treatment. <coughs> so, and this is quite demanding. If we put both things together, 
the concern within the pharmaceutical industry is that it will be a high burden to, to many companies, particularly to small companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of them are those dealing with antimicrobials. So probably yeah. many of the most vulnerable uh, drugs could, uh, could have a problem for supply, so for mm -hmm. being supplied to the citizens. So this is the main concern. I think we have to go in that direction, but please um, let's sit down together and see what the implications are. Um, yeah, and then try to ha to make something that can be implemented, maybe um, in the long distance, not immediately, mm -hmm. and do we need uh, something that can be afforded by all parts without uh, compromising mm -hmm. the public health and the system. Okay. And mm -hmm. for el the other mm, question era training. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to, to ask the, you that. At the first time I said, okay, training, what? Wow, that's, I mean, we have huge problems <laughs> on the table, so maybe training is the less of the problems, but of course, still we need to understand many, many aspects of the legislation. There are, we need clarity in the definitions, what is biodegradable, what is uh, micro-contaminants, what is um, unsatisfactory unsatisf risk <coughs> assessment or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to really know what the regulator is looking for. Uh, okay. and first. But there is always room for uh, learning, and uh, that, uh -huh. of course. And, uh, um, and I cannot give you a, a, a formal answer, but uh, since mm -hmm. I will start with uh, the working group, I will ask my associates dealing with uh, antimicrobials, and I will ask them if there is a need for teaching, for any training, and I will go back to you, Anne. I'm sure the project team will be uh, really attentive to, to that discussion <laughs> with, you, with your group because it's obvious that legislation and, and European and national directives mm -hmm. are important because somehow they determine the, 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 the field in which uh, we, are, we can play and the rules we use to play. But then uh, we also have practices which depend on the way we understand reality and the yeah. way we understand our own uh, sector. and. It's training that affects that, not only legislation. So absolutely, absolutely. We'll, I'm sure that the but, project team will pay attention to that discussion. Let me finish being positive. I mean, we sure. see all these changes as an opportunity to really do sure. things better. But uh, sure. perhaps we need to see how to do it well, OK? I'm sure of that. Let's be optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I suggest something, because I need that Arancha deserves some relaxation to breathe in, to breathe out. <laughs> what do you think if the open discussion is opened at the end of the, of the round table? Is that okay? Marta, is that okay? So that she I can uh, uh, relax for some minutes now. Thanks and, a lot. <laughs> uh, but remember the Padlet, okay? And uh, remember to add the questions to, to the Padlet, both you and, and the people in this streaming, okay? And uh, now we move to, to Jairo, to Jairo Gomez, okay? And, uh, to wastewater management. And we'll see that we have different problems, a different way of uh, facing reality and facing the, the challenge. And we are really interested in what you have to tell us. We will use the same structure, knowledge and attitudes, and then we'll move to the present analysis, then to the future, and then to gaps and, uh, gaps and needs. So, knowledge and, and attitudes, and uh, how do we, we we have thought of three questions for you and, and your sector, you, having you as a representative. As a professional in the wastewater management sector, how do you perceive the role of wastewater in the spread of antimicrobial resistance? Being you an engineer, I mean, uh, you could say, I know nothing about that, that's not <laughs> as an engineer, but we know that you have a lot to, to tell us. How committed is the wastewater management uh, sector to ensuring regulatory compliance and promoting innovation in, in this area? And what essential measures do you consider necessary to effectively address AMR in wastewater management? You can answer the three of them as a block, if you mm -hmm. like. Okay, okay. Fido. Okay, well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me to be here today. Uh, to me, um, uh, industrial engineering, without mm. no previous knowledge about uh, antimicrobials, bacteria, uh, <coughs> resistant bacteria. Uh, but the, the reality is uh, that all this project uh, is new, is a new world for, for us, the wastewater treatment. Uh, I have been working in wastewater treatment 
uh, about uh, 20 years, and I have only become aware uh, of the problem of antimicrobial resistance in the last five years. Um, this is because I was in re research and development. If no, uh, I, I didn't uh, know about the topic. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> bueno, uh, first, uh, first I want uh, to say that it's important to remark that urban wastewater uh, is a mirror of our society. Good. Vale. The products that uh, all of you consume finish in the sewer and then uh, finish in the wastewater treatment plants. Our plants are not factories and we don't add any substances to the wastewater. We only treat and remove uh, what comes from, from the locality, from, from your house. Uh, we don't choose the, the raw materials on the influence with which processes works in the wastewater treatment plant. And our out outlets, our effluents, are the points where the society, society's waste is discharged into the environment. Mm -hmm. and we are the points, I mm -hmm. think. <laughs> Most of the wastewater treatment plants were designed uh, years ago according uh, with the legislation uh, of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they, are, uh, they were designed to remove organic matter from wastewater, uh, chemical oxygen demand, nitrogen and phosphorus. And now appears, appears new contaminants and we want to remove, to remove them in the wastewater treatment plants. But uh, new contaminants uh, need new spe specific treatments to be removed from the water. We can't remove one new thing uh, from one day to other day. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the, the most uh, treatments applied in the plants, in the wastewater treatment plants, are biological. So we need bacteria. Then the possibility of having ecosystems that promote the creation of new antimicrobial microbial resistance in our facilities is a field that uh, has begun to be researched in recent years. Uh, we know that probably new resistant bacteria will be, will, uh, be created. But don't worry, because at the end of the wastewater treatment plant, we have uh, sedimentation, clarify, clarifiers, settlers, mm -hmm. where the bacteria are separated from the treated uh, water, and the bacteria is part of the sludge, the famous sludge. And we uh, separate them, we treat them, and after it, pues, we use it in, in agriculture or we use it, uh, it, it uh, as a materia prima from combustion. Yeah, or raw material. Or something, or something similar, yes, raw material. Uh, the last advances in genetics have allowed, allowed us uh, to advance in our knowledge of these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, about the... Uh, the, if we are aware, uh, yes, the sector is really aware in order to comply with the legislation that applies to us. Uh, what happens? That normally the legislation goes very slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's a, it's a fact that antibiotics and antimicrobials and other substances can create antimicrobial resistance, there, there are currently no specific treatments implemented in most of the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, oh, around the world to eliminate, to remove them, to remove them. However, a new European directive on, on urban wastewater treatment has been approved recently, this year, in November, uh, we think that it begins. It begins. Uh, and this uh, directive uh, <coughs> sets the need for the implementation of treatments that will allow the, re the removal of these substances. Public managers involved in, involved in wastewater treatment, yes are very aware of the issue, issue and its dangers. Uh, and there are currently several research projects that will allow us to face the problem. The first step, uh, that is what we are doing now, is to have a good diagnosis in order, in order to know where to act. Mm -hmm. uh, about the essential measures, uh, at the treatment plants, we receive uh, certain levels of antimicrobials and other pharmaceutical products and resistant bacteria. We receive resistant bacteria. In fact, we have also been able to uh, detect them in the rivers as uh, they pass uh, through the cities, even before the wastewater treatment plants. 
In other words, the resistant bacteria are in the este are in the so we have resistant bacteria in the in the environment. environment. The, environment. the most effective way to reduce them would be to prevent them uh, by placing adequate treatments at source. But for this, uh, we need it's necessary that the legislation advances towards these requirements by demanding these antimicrobial remo removal treatments and lim limiting their content in drops and effluents. Therefore, we need to train legislators about this problem that, uh, that concern us today. Uh, on the other hand, it's very important, not in the wastewater uh, treatment plan, uh, you know, uh, at home, it's very important that all of us make a correct use of antibiotics, antimicrobials, and other pharmaceutical products. Since the more they are used, the more they are sent to the sewage system, and from there to the wastewater treatment plant, and part of them to the river, to the environment. For them, uh, what we consider most important is a correct control at source. I think it's very interesting this uh, <laughs> ecosystemic perspective that you have given us. No? Uh, wastewater management uh, plants are a mirror of our societies. Yes. And, and so we can process what we get, but there are more than we get and it's there in the environment. And uh, whatever we do at home, ha it has a, an impact, not only in the, in the plant, but also in, uh, in our rivers, which is very yes. interesting. Yes, we, we can remove, separate the, the resistant bacteria, but the antimicrobials that we don't have uh, removed go to the river and can create new resistant bacteria. Okay, very interesting. And then we are trying, we are almost understanding what the sludge is. So first step <laughs> achieved, okay, the sludge. So now, practices. Two questions, uh, second question on the present. How does your sector assess the environmental and public health risks posed by antimicrobial residues and resistant bacteria in wastewater? So, assessment. And could you describe the treatment technologies you employ in an easy to understand way for us, who, for, for those of us who are not engineers? So, can you describe the treatment technologies you employ to effectively remove antimicrobials and resistant bacteria from wastewater? Okay, uh, to the first question, I have to say that we usually don't assess. Okay. We advise and we alert. Okay. Uh, once we have started to, me to measure the antimicrobials and resistant bacteria, and I have said we have started to measure them because the measurement techniques are quite re recent. recent. We, be we become aware of the problem and work on car carrying out uh, studies that reflect the problem so that we can transfer it to the environmental and health authorities. In this line, the so-called wastewater-based uh, epidemiology is taking importance in, in Europe. This method uh, was born during COVID. All of us uh, measure uh, the IRN of COVID in the wastewater treatment plants and say to the health authorities, hey, we, we are going to have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, COVID in this city. Okay. Uh, we can measure it, but the work uh, to face the problem must to be uh, undertaken together by technicians, politicians, legislators, and general public. The approach to this situation has to be multidisciplinary. Uh, in addition to research and innovation to determine the current situation in wastewater and how to remove the concentration in flows, is more important communi communication and dissemination. This work uh, is needed so that everyone at home is, is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, respect the technologies, uh, uh, so the, the antibiotics uh, and uh, the antimicrobials can create antimicrobial resistance. But there are currently no specific treatments in our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, in Spain, uh, very, very little uh, treatment. The new European directive on the urban wastewater treatment sets a date, a specific date, uh, for the implementation of quaternary treatments that are designed to remove micropollutants. And we hope 
that uh, these treatments will allow us the removal of antimicrobial and the retention of resistant, resistant bacteria. The problem is that this should be done by 2045. We have a lot of years uh, to, wait, uh, to wait to these treatments. These treatments are very, very expensive and complex and usually require a high energy consumption. The implementation of these treatments will be done uh, in wastewater treatment plants uh, very big, with a population equivalent uh, of more than 150,000 equivalent inhabitants. And also in sensitive areas, such as bathing areas, uh, or areas with, with drinking water collec collection, or so on. Among the quaternary technologies, the technologies that are based on absorption, absorption separation by mem membranes, and both biological and chemical degradation. Uh, mm -hmm. Here we have the famous advanced oxidation processes. The effectiveness of these treatments depends uh, on the substance that we want to remove. It's not the same, the mm -hmm. acetromycin, or the, there are different uh, kinetics. But uh, the most effective way, I want to say another uh, thing, is to reduce them, uh, uh, to prevent them by placing adequate treatments at the outlets of hospitals, at the outlets of nursing homes, and the outlets of slaughter, slaughterhouses and, and pharmaceutical companies, where the flows are lower and the concentrations higher. This means greater efficiency Mm -hmm. and, grit, uh, uh, and, and less price is, is cheaper mm -hmm. uh, uh, than rem uh, the removal process in wastewater treatment plants, wh where the concentrations uh, due to the dilution of the big flow that we have uh, are currently very low. So, in fact, for the practices, we have a five-year uh, perspective, but for the Next steps, we have a horizon until 2045. No, no, uh, 2045. 2045, that is, that yes. is it. Let's so have. let's talk about that horizon, about okay. the future. Do you, do you or does your sector plan to implement any strategies or initiatives to enhance effective treatment, monitoring system, and our, and or risk assessment related to antimicrobial residues in wastewater. You have already started telling mm -hmm. us about that and mm -hmm. because your, your answer was leading that way. But is there any, anything in particular uh, to talk about the future? Uh, yes, well, as we have said, mm -hmm. we have to put the treatments okay. uh, as legislation dictates. Okay. Uh, usually the wastewater treatment plant is a uh, uh, is conducted by public companies and all of us are going to comply with the legislation. Uh, the problem is the money, but well, we, will, we will see how to pay it. No? Uh, in addition, there are more and more research project, projects uh, on these treatments to improve them, to, mm -hmm. to make them uh, cheaper and more, more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the initiatives, there are some very important, such as the one that brings, brings us together here today, the Jam Ray 2. It's a project is a, a good example. And I would like to mention another example that is the emergency project. This is an Interreg Poctefa, an European project, mm -hmm. uh, that is conducted by, by us, by NILSA, and is focused on the detention, detection of antibiotics, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and antibiotic resistance genes in the urban cycle of uh, water from the Poctefa territory, that is France, Portugal, and the north of Spain. It also studies the, elim the elimination of the antimicrobials by using new technologies in wastewater treatment. And it's very important to raise public, public awareness about the, rela the rela relationship between antibiotic use, mm -hmm. environment, environment and balance, and public health. Mm -hmm as well as educating stakeholders, including general public, uh, about the importance of responsible antibiotic use and, anti, uh, and its proper disposal, as I said before. Okay, so again, coming to the idea that Marta already introduced this morning, 
not working in silos is uh, fundamentally not yes. only for the One Health approach, but also for this specific problem that we are dealing with and mm -hmm. AMR. But what about the gaps and training needs? What have you discovered uh, in connection to, to this problem? What challenges do you, does your sector face in the treatment and monitoring of antimicrobial residues and resistant bacteria? And what initiatives or resources do you believe that might enhance your sector's response to AMR? What okay. can you tell us about it? Yes. Uh, the main challenge we face is the cost of the analysis okay. of the antimicrobials. I don't know, but it's around 800 euros one analysis in wastewater. Uh, and the cost of the treatment that is needed. needed. Uh, some of these quaternary treatments are much more expensive that, than the current price of the complete wastewater treatment, including the sludge treatment and the sludge uh, disposal. We are talking about five times more expensive the quaternary treatment that, than the rest of the wastewater treatment. This is because it, it's important to treat to treat it, uh, to treat the antimicrobials where they are produced, mm -hmm. because it's the same price uh, per cubic meter, but, but uh, in the wastewater treatment plant, it is very, very, very dilute, dilute uh, and it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. The implementation of these uh, treatments also requires large public tenders uh, that delay their implementation. And in addition, it, involve, it involves expanding or uh, modifying the large exist, existing uh, wastewater treatment plants, and this is uh, not always possible due to the lack of space in the area or, or the impossibility to stop the actual processes to add a new process. Uh, and finally, these processes usually become a big amount of energy, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to implement uh, while complying with uh, the energy self-sufficiency that is required of us in the same European directive. So do more things, uh, cheaper, and not use more energy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible. Impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, initiatives and resource. Pues, uh, as I said, uh, wastewater, I want to say again, <laughs> is a mirror of the society. And the best improvement can, uh, we can have is to have fewer, uh, less antimicrobials in the sewer network, network in, the, in the sewage. Of course, it would be a good idea to train plane operators, no? wastewater plane operators, but uh, only to be aware of the problem that, that are arising. But in addition, I think, no, I believe that training legislators, no, uh, health professionals and the general public can be a great benefit to face the problem. I think that wastewater is uh, one tool to, mm -hmm. to say to the rest of the society, uh, help us because all the antimicrobials are here and if, if we don't not, uh, if we don't do uh, anything, they are going to the, to the river, to the sea, and to the environment. Uh, I believe that, that the best training method, method is to make informational campaigns specifically uh, directed to each uh, target audience. And I would like to repeat uh, two ideas. No? Okay. The mirror of the society, Mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, all of we uh, have to work together to face the problem of the antimicrobial resistance. Well, certainly the, the, these okay. are two important uh, messages. And even though when I was listening to you, as I <laughs> come from the south of, of Europe, and I, I keep thinking of Africa and Eastern countries, and how could we export these ideas and then talk about investments and costs and and these sort of difficulties that you were mentioning, but in other areas of the, of the world and uh, with different uh, investment possibilities and, and expectations. But let's keep that for, for, for the discussion if you, if you want mm -hmm. to, okay? okay? And let's, well, let's remember that we have a Padlet. You, you remember that? Yeah? 
Are you writing on the Padlet? Yeah. Innovative learning, yeah. Padlet once and again. And then we, we uh, uh, let uh, Hyro breathe in, breathe out. And uh, we yield the floor to Ana, to Ana Molinero. And again, there are four sets of questions, okay? And the first one about knowledge and attitudes, the base ground of everything. How would you assess the current level of awareness among community pharmacists regarding the impact of antimicrobial resistance on, resistance on public health? And what is the general knowledge or per perspective of pharmacists regarding the environment's role in antimicrobial resistance? This is a difficult question to, to answer because you are not all the pharmacists, yes. but you are here as a representative. So don't feel that you are talking for everyone, but your opinion is extremely relevant for us, Anna. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to the uh, CEFAC, to these uh, uh, sessions. Uh, because we think we are important in this uh, chain about the uh, antimicrobial re resistance. Um, uh, this session has been a challenge for me because for the short time I have uh, to prepare it and because this is in, in English. So I apologize for it. My English is not uh, as good as it must be, but I, I try to do the, the best I can. But you remember, <laughs> you remember, we love you, okay? <laughs> That's an important oh. thing, okay? That's okay. okay. It's enough for me. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, uh, I would assess that in the current level of uh, awareness of community pharmacies uh, as height. Uh, they have, uh, have re realized that the, the problem of the antimicrobial uh, resistance uh, need to be uh, addressed under the One Health. The, the problem of the One Health approach. Uh, as you say, this uh, approach is for humans, for animals, and for the uh, environment. And uh, we think the community pharmacy should be uh, in, in, the, in the best way uh, to, to afford for, for this, because they dispense uh, medicine for human use, but also dispense medicine for animals, and they are responsible for uh, collecting antimicrobials for all types that have expired or are left at home uh, where there is an over-treatment, which implies that community pharmacies uh, are not only addressing the risk of antimicrobial resistance in patients, but also they have a role in promoting rational uh, use of antimicrobials to prevent their spread. Awareness has in increased uh, due not only to public health uh, campaigns and continuing education programs uh, that promote correct dispensing of, of medicines, pacing education on the appropriate use and participation in global resistance uh, control uh, strategy. But also, in our case, the community pharmacies uh, have in, the, in our uh, last Congress a special session to uh, abort uh, the One Health problem and how to um, do with this uh, new challenge that we have to, to have. And because we have uh, participated in investigation uh, studies like uh, happy patient that perhaps uh, most of, of you uh, know ab about it. Um, the second one, the, the, <laughs> the knowledge of, of, of perspective on the pharmacist. I think uh, the pharmacists have a very in-deep uh, knowledge about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and uh, are very best po uh, positioned to understand how antibiotics, even uh, at the low con concentrations in the uh, environment, can exert uh, selective pressure on mi microorganisms, driving the development of uh, resistant uh, strains. They also recognize that uh, environments like uh, wastewater, trees, plants, can serve as breeding grounds for antimicrobial uh, resistance. 
perhaps now we have changed the, our mind after we have said again, my colleague <laughs> Jairo. Mm. Uh, pharmacists uh, lead in promoting uh, drug take back programs and educating the public about the importance of not throwing and using medication in the bean or in the uh, WC because this, these conducts uh, can con contribute to uh, environmental uh, contamination. By raising uh, awareness and encouraging uh, responsible behaviors, pharmacies help mitigate uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance development because by uh, pharmacy uh, waste. We can talk about this uh, later. Okay, okay. Let's talk about it later then. Yes. Let's talk about practices and the present. <coughs> okay, so what well, strategies does your sector yes. uh, use to support and promote the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs in healthcare settings and pharmacies? And how do you encourage and ensure that patients return unused or expired antimicrobials for proper disposal? Sigrid has already been mentioned, but I'm sure that you're doing much more than, than that. Okay, I will uh, first talk about uh, what uh, we do daily in our uh, clinical uh, practice. Okay. And then uh, I will talk about uh, one uh, program uh, designed at uh, Conoceme, no me, that okay. is an uh, educational uh, program in uh, educational centers, uh, centers to raise awareness about the proper use of anti antibiotics, the rise of antimicrobial uh, resistance, mm -hmm. and the importance of proper disposal methods to prevent environmental uh, contamination. In, in our daily practice, uh, we, uh, uh, our main activity is uh, to dispense uh, medicines. Mm -hmm. Medicines, as I have said, for humans and for, for animals. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of, uh, of humans, we only, uh, not only we give the, the medicines to, to the patients, but uh, we, uh, I, we ensure that uh, the patients know what is, uh, had been uh, prescribed for this medicine and how they have to, to use it. It's, uh, the number that they, they have to, to take the, the antibiotic and not discontinuing the treatment, even if they are uh, improving your, their uh, pathology. And uh, at, uh, at the end, uh, that uh, if they uh, have um, leftovers, they have to uh, put them into the uh, cigre uh, point mm -hmm. that we have uh, talked about uh, it before, the, the container that all, all uh, community pharmacies have in, in our community uh, pharmacies. Um, this is the, 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 the most important to prevent in the, in the future uh, antimicrobial resistance, and uh, this is um, reduce the risk of, uh, uh, of antimicrobial contamination. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, encourage uh, to not uh, uh, have to, to save uh, leftovers for future uh, use, because this is uh, very important, because this, uh, uh, any, any kind of uh, antibiotics is needed for one person in one occasion. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not uh, the same for uh, any kind of, uh, of, of mm -hmm. people. And uh, if we don't know, uh, we don't do that, it's uh, dangerous and could con contribute uh, to uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we not only dispense uh, medicines, because in, in most cases we indicate medicines for uh, a, a symptom. Um, and uh, in, in this case, we uh, always ask uh, for uh, when, when someone uh, asks uh, ask for an antibiotic without prescription, 
that is not mm, very, very usual, but is uh, usual uh, every day, um, we uh, not only uh, tell them that uh, we need uh, the prescription for the ant antibiotic, uh, but also ask them what they want uh, to use for. Um, most of uh, the time they say that is for, for flu or for cold system, system, si symptom. And we ask about what kind of, si of <coughs> symptoms they, they, they have. And after uh, applying what we uh, call a referral uh, criteria, uh, criteria to a physician, in most cases we can solve the problem without use an, an antibiotic. And in other cases, we refer to the, the physician see, see if, if it is ne necessary. In both, in both cases, we always es explain that uh, antibiotics are not used for viruses infections. That is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this uh, use could increase the antimicrobial resistance. And then uh, I like uh, to talk about uh, Naomi, Conoceme. Mm -hmm. This is an uh, educational uh, program that we uh, offer to the fourth year secondary students in the, at, at the schools and institute. And this consists in, in a session when we uh, uh, first ask them uh, uh, about uh, questions uh, um, related to the use of antibiotics. Uh, if they know uh, it is uh, are for um, uh, virus, viruses or bacteria or uh, the time they have to, to use, uh, after that, uh, we uh, uh, provide an uh, educational um, talk uh, about the correct use of the ant antibiotics. And at the end, we uh, do the same questions that we uh, have did uh, b before. And, uh, well, uh, they improve. Um, in, in most cases, they, uh, the 100% uh, is correct at, at, the, at, the, at the last uh, time. It's a, a program that is a, a very good uh, rated by students and for, and for schools. Uh, next, month, uh, next month, we uh, will be st starting the, the fourth uh, edition, and uh, we uh, left the, the training to, to the schools uh, in case they uh, want to, to use uh, this in the in in, in other in other uh, time and uh, well how uh, we encourage and ensure uh, we can encourage <coughs> but we can't ensure that <laughs> this is good or not uh, I have a I already mentioned it that uh, before uh, what we uh, do when we dis dispense an antibiotic. But uh, there is another point that uh, we do uh, too, that is with uh, <coughs> the medicine uh, reviews in a medicine cabinet. I'm not sure if this is a correct uh, name for a botiquin casero. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. could be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we always uh, remind when we uh, revise this uh, medicine cabinet, we always remind people that uh, antibiotics are not a part of the kit. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, antibiotics should be outside this, uh, this kit. And that uh, they should uh, be discarded, the antibiotics, mm -hmm. once the treatment is completed. And if they have any expired uh, antibiotics, we encourage them to dispose uh, them in the cigarette uh, container. Well, it's very interesting. The practice that you are performing, but also the distinction between encouraging and ensuring. And uh, we would like to be able to ensure, uh, but in fact, it's encouraging what we normally do. And also very interesting that program, Conoceme, Get to Know Me, 
uh, could be translated, um, which is a way not only of letting uh, the, the public uh, to get to know you, but also to get to know the guidance is and, the, and the protocols that you follow. Yes. Very, very interesting. You must know that in, in the pram, uh, there is a, a, a point that, that say the uh, adolescents will be a target audience for awareness in the, in the next plan. So mm -hmm. we, sure. uh, we have done this during three years uh, before, and we totally agreed with, with, with this. Mm. And this morning we were discussing that it's much better to educate teenagers than yes. adults. Harder, but better. Yes. Okay? <laughs> but uh, I think they, in, in, in the uh, uh, prochain future, they say they have forgot uh, everything they have uh, studied in this period of, of okay. time. But I'm completely sure that in the next future, they remind uh, what they have uh, studied. And I, I think it's a good idea yeah, to, right. to, to put the... The, the, the point not of our view in, in these in this persons, in other I agree, sense. I agree with you. Just one question about the future, about next steps. What collaborative efforts, and the emphasis here is on collaborative, uh, collaborative efforts, uh, do you plan to raise awareness and encourage, now encourage <laughs> the use of take-back schemes for unwanted, unused, or expired medicines? Well, okay. uh, next month, uh, we will uh, participate uh, alongside other uh, scientific uh, societies in a, a campaign on the rational use of uh, antibiotics and antifungals, which will uh, take place during the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week uh, with uh, left uh, flats in the pharmacies and dissemination, dissemination on social media. This brochure uh, has various uh, messages, and one of them is uh, never give leftover medication nor dispose of it down the drain or in the trash. Take it to the secret point and your pharmacy. If you have any doubt, ask your trusted pharmacist. Well said, well done, perfect motto, okay? And our last question for you and for the three of you. What challenges do pharmacists encounter in promoting take-back schemes? That's the first question. And what initiatives <coughs> or resources do you believe would enhance your sectors and people's response to AMR? Yes. What do you think? Our main challenges is that we need to face is how uh, to measure the impact of our intervention. We do an educational intervention with the students. We uh, measure uh, the improvement, but with the uh, people, we don't know if this is good or this is uh, mm -hmm. not. So uh, we will need indicators uh, to use, and for uh, that, uh, for to do this, uh, we need to collaborate with the Spanish uh, Agency of Medicines and Medical device. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm taking uh, advantage of the fact that I am here and I extend <laughs> our offer <laughs> as a fact to start working uh, with the uh, EMS uh, under the umbrella of, of Brown to, to, to know about the, the impact of uh, uh, what we, we do. And the initiatives, well, the, the last uh, question is not a, a question. There are a lot of questions only in, in, in one. But As it normally happens. No, no, no problem, yes. Yeah. No problem. I, I, I think the most important initiative uh, to avoid uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, is to prevent the, the infection through the hygiene practice and vaccination. Uh, I think we have uh, spent more time uh, to do that. Then for the uh, community pharmacy, it uh, will be useful, uh, workshops and seminars, practical, interactive, uh, with other uh, um, professionals 
uh, with uh, case studies, uh, real life uh, scenarios, and problems of uh, uh, and problems and uh, perhaps two e-learning platforms uh, with online courses or webinars that uh, were uh, accessible, feasible, uh, and can, uh, can be continuously uh, updated with the latest research on uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. And for people, as I, I would say, school-based uh, programs, uh, younger audience, uh, by and perhaps integrating the uh, antimicrobial uh, resistant education into a school uh, curricula to raise uh, awareness uh, early. Social me media campaigns, of course, uh, for all uh, kind of, of <coughs> public, but particularly in younger uh, audience with conscious, short uh, messages about the antibiotic uh, resistance and uh, the public in information uh, campaigns, uh, leaflets, poster, info infographics, uh, in different areas, but especially in healthcare uh, centers and community pharmacies and hospitals, uh, uh, all uh, related with the healthcare, but with the same message. I think it's very, very important to have the same message about the antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance in the community pharmacy, in the hospital, in the uh, healthcare centers, in, uh, I don't know, in, in the, the bus, mm -hmm. the, the same message uh, uh, every time. And yeah, thank you very much. Well, we are really thankful for the three of you for making the effort of speaking in English and for creating such an interesting to-do list for the project team because you have opened many fields and many topics to, to discuss. And now, again, open discussion. Can we have a look at the Padlet, perhaps? We have something like a quarter of an hour, isn't it? Marta, Anne, yeah? Like a quarter of an hour for us to see if there are questions in the Padlet, and uh, if any of those questions is addressed for any of our three <coughs> experts and representatives. If there is any problem, I can get my computer and uh, have a look at the Padlet in my computer. No questions. <coughs> ah, yeah, we mm. here we are, okay. Okay. And uh, so we have a question for Arancha over there. And how much do you think the pharma industry is willing, in, into inverted commas, you know, <laughs> to follow, let's say, the findings or recommendations <coughs> of the project team and the project? And how much are they able, also in, to invert, in inverted commas, to do it? Willingness and real capacity to follow whatever this project is able to produce for, for you? Well, I think I already tried, at least tried to address it, but um, willingness, there is willingness, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. I think we have a common um, objective. The question is, um, what are you uh, requesting and in what uh, timelines? Uh, and because this will be uh, the, key, the, key, the key question, the key yeah. issue. And for some um, companies, I mean, they are already working on it. I mean, and, and they are doing their, their trainings, they are interacting with other agents uh, to see what the, the implications will be. Mm -hmm. There are some, as um, you already mentioned, I don't know these numbers, but I always have heard that these quaternary treatments is really something really um, difficult to afford <laughs> by mm -hmm. companies because apparently it's a lot of money in a short period of time. Uh, because this is all going down to pharma industry and mm -hmm. I think cosmetic industry and according to the legislation, so it's, it will be only on, to, in, on two uh, industries uh, mm -hmm. assuming the, the totality. And of course, adapting and making changes is more difficult for medicinal products because you are um, tightly um, regulated. 
Yeah, it's okay. Delivery. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you cannot do changes and yeah, go back to the market. You have to go through a regulatory system. You may change this in the way you manufacture the, the product. So, I mean, it requires uh, a lot of procedures and it, it, it takes time. So it's it's difficult. But there is willingness. Um, mm -hmm. But perhaps we have to still discuss how uh, and and what will be the requirements. For example, uh, is it needed for perhaps every um, medicinal product to go through a tertiary and quaternary treatment? Um, yes. Maybe you can remove with a tertiary, extended tertiary tre treatment and some of the antimicrobials and <laughs> there is no need to go further. So these are the key questions we, are n we don't really know now. And, and in so fact, that question is also present in the, in the <laughs> padlet because they are asking, okay. <laughs> at what stage of wastewater management do you consider addressing? The AMR in wastewater, and that's a question for you, mm. Jairo, over here. Yes. So, uh, do we have to reach that quaternary <coughs> stage? Yes. Or? yes, we are studying all the possibilities in the project <coughs> that I have mentioned. Uh, the, the real thing is that a quaternary treatment costs, costs about two, uh, between one and two euros uh, per cubic meter. <coughs> And it's the same price uh, at the uh, at the outlet of a, a medical company or a hospital, or in the wastewater treatment plant. An example uh, to put numbers: uh, uh, we have in Navarra one pharmaceutical, a big pharmaceutical company that can have more than less 40 or 50 cubic meters a day. <laughs> this is a uh, hundred euros per day of, of treatment, no? but it goes to a treatment plant uh, that has uh, 60,000 cubic meters per day. Wow. This is 120, a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If we can reduce it at origin, I don't know uh, yeah. who, who have mm -hmm. to pay. Uh, the cost in the wet water treatment plant, plant is, is, is lower. And the cost in the wastewater water treatment plant uh, is going to be paid for all of us because the cost of the, of the treatment is in our water receipts at home. Uh, the, yeah, oh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, of, of the receipt of water, normally, a half is for for drinking water, and a half is for for treatment um, before the, the environment. And now, with the new European directive, we are working in a group with the ministry to try to calculate how much half the water uh, has have to cost to come pay the treatment that the European directive is saying us that, that we have to do. Perhaps from u one euro to five euros cubic meter at home, it it could be possible. Okay, we are now going to offer a question to Anna, but there are two interesting questions for you, more from the technical side. Okay, the first one for Jairo, that will be later. Okay, first Anna, and then both of you about treatment technologies and if these technologies are effective to detect and remove resistant genes, okay, mm -hmm. you think about it. And uh, we finish the round table with a sludge question. <laughs> okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's for you, okay? That's okay. by the end, at four o'clock, okay? And for Arancha, there are two questions, a long one and a short one. It depends on how much Anna speaks, okay? okay. <laughs> If she speaks a lot, you will go for what technologies are used in the industry <coughs> to monitor the levels of antimicrobials. Keep the answer, keep the answer. Okay, keep it there. <laughs> the other one. Anna, what do you think? <laughs> you prefer the other one? Yes. Okay, we go for that. Anna, we have a, a question I think a community pharmacist may answer sincerely. <coughs> in some European countries, individualized packaging, that is a specific doses for treatment of antibiotics is being implemented within an, 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 a, an a, a stewardship uh, approach. Uh, how do you see this measure can impact the AMS <coughs> in environment? 
You think, is it, posi is it positive? Is it irrelevant? It may have no impact in environment, not, not just in the human uh, being. What do you think? It's an opinion, okay. I, you are not talking about, you're not talking as the representative yes. of anything. Your opinion. Yes. Uh, my opinion, it could be a uh, negative impact in the environment because uh, the, the packages it, uh, are not, not good for uh, environment. And uh, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, packaging uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ways and they uh, have to, to treat these uh, packages and to uh, reuse, recycle, okay. uh, recycle uh, this. And I, I think the, mes the measure, it, uh, perhaps, it uh, couldn't be uh, cost uh, effective. Okay. I, I think it's, it's better to, to go in, in other way uh, about um, educational uh, programs uh, to, to work all, all together, and I, I, I think it could be better. Okay, that's from the recycling perspective, but from the antimicrobial stewardship perspective, <coughs> do you think individual packaging may be interesting or, or irrelevant or negative, perhaps? What do you think? Not only for <coughs> the environment, in uh, recycling in terms, which is very important, obviously, but in relation to antimicrobial stewardship, what do you think? Difficult to know, a priori? I, I, in, in, the, in the first one, when there is a, a, in there are a prescription, okay. that now it could be for uh, seven days. Okay. It, it, I, I think it's, it's the same to give the, uh, the person, okay. the patients, uh, seven uh, packages, uh, small packages with uh, <coughs> antibiotics, Okay. That uh, to to give them the the seven uh, uh, do doses in in one uh, okay. packages, uh, always with information about <coughs> the risks of uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Okay, perfect, perfect. Now, Heido, we we go to the treatment technologies uh, question for removal of antimicrobials and, and resistant bacteria, you know, the super bacteria and so on. Are these technologies also effective to detect and remove resistant genes? What do you think? What do you uh, know about it? I, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's something, okay. No, no, the, the <laughs> treatment, uh, we know that can uh, drop the bacteria, not break the bacteria and, and kill them, but mm -hmm. uh, that we think is that genes, uh, there are the genes, and the genes continue um, at the media. Okay. We suppose it, but now in the, in the project that we have, the emergency project, we are trying to, to measure it. Okay. If, but uh, I think, I don't, I'm not biologist, uh, biochemical, but I think that the, the the genes have to be desnaturalized. The I don't know. Uh, in Probably denaturalized or something similar to that. Yes, and our treatments is uh, uh, more simple to, okay. to do it. Okay, so now we go for the long question. Okay, so yeah. I think. <laughs> okay. No, no, we have time for the long question and then the sludge. I'm very sorry. <coughs> Probably I should know, but I mean, I, I, did, I don't know nothing about the technologies. Uh, so, we, we, can homework. we can skip it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Martina, thank you for the question, and that is for <coughs> our second meeting. Okay? We kept that question for our second meeting. So, so you know, the upcoming uh, review of the European pharmaceutical legislation on human medications. And uh, this person, uh, what an eye is interested in understanding <coughs> how the environmental requir requirements could affect manufacturing costs, okay? And consequently, the final price of medications, which in Spain is very low. Sometimes, as she says, even lower than the manufacturing costs. And she wanted to, to know if <coughs> uh, you can give us your opinion yeah. or the industry's opinion if yeah. you're this if is you do. this is very a rel very relevant question okay. i mean um the problem with the proposal of the new legislation i previously mentioned that i mean they are proposing this extended uh, environmental risk assessment where um 
based on these grounds, you could have um, mm -hmm. negative uh, uh, marketing authorization, a negative opinion, mm -hmm. or uh, the marketing authorization of a product that is already on the market. If there is any change, it could be revoked, suspended, or, or withdrawal. Um, this is, of course, uh, quite critical. Uh, if we are Mm -hmm. talking about antibiotics because we only have just a few and, and mm -hmm. the, the effectiveness is compromised because of the um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. So we are dealing with um, <coughs> particularly vulnerable medicines. Okay. Okay? And so the consequences of that could be that you miss a, 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 um, a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> so this has public health consequences. So this, the environment is important, but we have the, the, the public health as well. So we have to balance the two things. But this extended uh, environmental risk assessment also, I think, uh, I, I don't know in total detail, but they are also proposing uh, to include the manufacturing in the case of antimicrobials, including the manufacturing um, within the environmental risk assessment for antimicrobials, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is probably right. Uh, <laughs> but the problem is that the, um, sometimes for antimicrobials you have different manufacturing sites. This is a very dynamic uh, mm -hmm. situation where you have to keep the supply chain and sometimes you use this one or if it here there's, there is a problem, you have to use another one. Mm -hmm. So you have to adapt and, and to really uh, respond to the, to the market needs. Mm -hmm. And if you have to ask for an environmental risk assessment and go to the regulator because this may change with these changes that could put a burden on the industry and also on the regulator that is difficult to assume. So I don't think it's a matter of increasing the cost of, of the medicines, okay. but this could have an impact on the access to new medicines and on the access uh, to medicines that are all, uh, already on the market. In this case, antimicrobials, which is really a weapon we need. <laughs> so, uh, this is the problem, and, and okay. the person who made the, these questions knows that this is a really a weak balance. I mean, it's true that it, there is a lot of efforts in doing research and development of antimicrobials. It's a difficult uh, research and development process uh, with a lot of failure, and the problem is that when you have a marketing authorization, which you have is a very limited market because we are restricting the use of antimicrobials, which is correct, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Uh, new antimicrobials go to the very last line because you, we want to research them just to make them still useful when we mm -hmm. need them. So the market is really small, like um, let's say, like orphan conditions. The problem is that for m antimicrobials, the system uh, doesn't pay for this value because it has a huge value. For mm -hmm. orphan uh, medicinal products, we are ready to pay whatever. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we don't, the, the system, doesn't give the value of having this weapon. So uh, we pay just, yeah, something insignificant in many cases. Okay. So this could be a really, <coughs> I mean, if you force the system, this could create that maybe some companies couldn't be able to afford it and to continue supplying the market. So okay. it's true there is, a, there is a risk. You have to balance, yeah, this uh, high good objective of protecting the environment, mm -hmm. but we are, yeah, in such a vulnerable situation that it's very particular of the, of the antimicrobials, so. Okay, so we'll have to pay we, attention. We have to sit to down, review. yeah, and take care of all these things because, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for your, for your <laughs> answer. And uh, well, finally, we have, as you know, we have organized this meeting just for you to explain what the sludge is. Okay. <laughs> so it's been almost two days to come to this point, and then very briefly, okay, because we, we, are, we have run out of time. So how much, a sludge is applied on agricultural soil. It's, I presume it's not easy to quantify, but no, yes, let's, yes. great. Yes. So <laughs> is it a common practice to reuse the final effluent as irrigation water in agricultural soil? What do you think, Jairo? Okay, about the sludge, uh, the sludge uh, usually is applied in agricultural soil in Spain as much as possible. Okay. There are some regulations uh, about uh, its stability, uh, its uh, metals content, its pathogens. You have to treat it, to uh, condition it, and to apply with a uh, very strict, uh, strict regulation, real decrets, decrets. Uh, it's possible, and if it's uh, well done, it's a good practice because in Spain our soils needs the 
de nutrients of the sludge. It's a recovery of nitrogen and phosphorus. Eh, economically is eh, circular economy. It's okay. a good practice. Eh, and it's done better than other wastes mm -hmm. that are applied in our eh, <coughs> soils without any restriction. Okay. About the, the water, eh, yes, there is a uh, water reutilization, uh, but this water has to have a tertiary or quaternary treatment to be a good water to to irrigate the agricultural soil. You can, as a, I can uh, use the w the water treated in my wastewater treatment plants in the agriculture. It has to have a, a extra treatment. And it's used uh, in regions like, uh, for example, in Murcia, they reuse a lot of water. They are the most, uh, the bigger knowledge in, 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 in uh, water reuse. In, in Asturias, they reuse water, but other, other communities like Navarra, we don't reuse water. Why? Uh, because we have water in, in river, uh, disp disponible, so we can take the water from river, we can uh, condition it and, and use in agriculture uh, cheaper and easier than to, to do this uh, kind of treatments to the water treated in the wastewater treatment mm -hmm. plant. So it depends of the needings of the, of the area. Okay, thank you indeed, Jairo, and please, <laughs> a big applause for the three of them. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Marta. <laughs> no, thanks to you. Thanks, thank you, Arancha. Thank you, Jairo. Thank you, Ana. And Fernando, obviously. <laughs> you can leave the stage <laughs> that you are you. Willing, to <laughs> willing to do. So we are coming to an end. Um, Please, uh, Ricardo, come to the stage for the con final conclusions. Espera. Es que si no, no se te ve. Okay, so I drafted uh, a very... Uh, crappy notes uh, uh, with the, as, a, as a conclusion. Um, so overall, at least for me, it was satisfactory. It, everything went better once we had drunk the, the, the wine during the, during the lunch. So I think I, that for the next meeting, maybe the, the, the Greek colleagues can bring ouzo or something like that for the beginning of the meeting. So we cover both parts of the meeting with, with some, some drinks also. Uh, no, it was... It was, I think, very, very useful to have this meeting. Um, so uh, those are the conclusions I drafted on the overall situation of the project. Uh, first of all, we have already carried out the target identification uh, report uh, that Fernando uh, m uh, mentioned that uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, first step. So we already know who should we target the, the, um, the uh, training and we have prioritized them and already defined a profile of each of the uh, stakeholders that would be involved. Um, on the part of the available material that is already, uh, well, the, the, the uh, training material, sorry, that is already available, we also have uh, results carried out by the, uh, kindly by, 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 um, uh, by the colleagues. And uh, it was um, interesting to note that the, the available material is somehow limited, so, so we have um, basically to start from scratch. Uh, so, but we have the previous experience on, uh, from, from what uh, is available there, but there's not much uh, um, that is also uh, uh, useful to know. And about um, uh, the survey uh, uh, to uh, know the knowledge, attitudes and uh, practices. Uh, um, I think it's very nicely um, uh, defined that that we, it will help us a lot once it has been uh, analyzed the results in understanding the different stakeholders. Um, uh, because, and that takes me to, to the Fernando part, because uh, uh, it's very important to understand the different uh, stakeholders that are involved. Uh, we are going to work with a 
multi-stakeholder coming from very different origins, uh, uh, very different uh, um, uh, um, training backgrounds, etc. And uh, it's really important to understand how does each of the sector works. And, and, and uh, I think that the, the survey for that will be uh, very um, uh, useful. Uh, also from the Fernando side, uh, um, uh, we must, through learning, make changes happen that i like that I, I i like that maybe it's not the final aim of the of the training or we might be close to that uh, aim or we should target that that aim uh, but assuming that that will be difficult so it's something to keep in our minds uh, but maybe uh, we mm, uh, should mm, uh, remain in the in the previous step uh, before that that would be like um, enlarging or changing uh, not enlarging making more complete the frameworks of the different stakeholders uh, uh, where they work um, in the last part uh, uh, that we just had uh, with the with the stakeholders and noting that not all the relevant stakeholders were present in the in the room but, but i really appreciate that we have the, the, the that we had the views of uh, uh, of those colleagues that that were here um, uh, there was, at least from, from the pharmaceutical industry and the um, uh, wastewater managers, uh, um, uh, uh, a lot of mentioning to the ongoing and future legislations. What uh, um, implies is that, well, we have to assume that everybody complies with the legislation when defining the training, of course, but uh, um, uh, I guess that the regulators have done uh, um, uh, made our life easier because as they have uh, or they are going to impose very strict regulations uh, all the sectors are starting to be more and more aware of these kind of things what takes me to something very interesting that uh, Jairo mentioned that uh, um, uh, about the training uh, and that we should train legislators it's a nice way of saying that legislators sometimes we don't know what we are talking about and that <laughs> but i think it's really uh, um, uh, good and important to to keep that in mind because the public administration is also one of our uh, stakeholders and something to uh, um, uh, uh, to think about that uh, we have to focus also on that uh, on that side um from the industry side, I see that they are very aware uh, of the problem, uh, um, uh, and of course they are, because they are uh, 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 pharmaceutical industry. So there, are, um, there has already um, a lot of work uh, that has been done. Uh, it was also nice to see that the, the, there is a working group that has been resuscitated and that they will uh, start or restart uh, working in antimicrobial uh, resistance. I don't know if it was specific in the environment or not, but uh, um, uh, there is also um, uh, 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 some initiatives that are coming from the industry to limit uh, uh, the emissions to the to the environment. So that shows us that they are uh, on the problem and that the training should be, uh, let's say, higher level because uh, uh, we should. Uh, understand that um, their uh, knowledge is higher than, than for other sectors. Um, they have many regula regulatory challenges and they don't seem to be very happy with it, but uh, it's not my problem or my way. Um, uh, sorry, I don't understand my letter. <laughs> Oh yeah, wastewater managers. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wastewater managers. Uh, Harido mentioned three times, and I will do it a fourth time. That the, the, the wastewater is a reflect of the society, and that is a way of saying that first of all, society is also responsible for for the wastes. That is something that both of them, industry and uh, um, water managers, have mentioned that all these things will have a cost. Uh, that will need to be assumed uh, by somebody uh, the cost of the uh, treating water or the cost of the medicine so that is something that uh, should be kept in mind by regulators not by not by us uh, thank god uh, but it's important uh, this part that it's a, um, a mirror of the society because there we have uh, as mentioned by Jairo uh, two important things that uh, um, uh, the wastewater as a place where to um, uh, have data for epidemiology use, that is, it has already happened with the COVID, 
uh, uh, but there is another project that is the EU wish that take, is taking care of that. Uh, and also very important to note that, uh, and that takes me to the pharmaceutic, uh, of all the community pharmacists, uh, the wrong disposal, that the, the best thing you can do is to work on the source of the uh, um, uh, of emission and the, uh, um, trying to reduce the wrong disposal of medicines through the sinks, uh, uh, toilets, uh, etc. Uh, is the best way to to um, to reduce as much as possible the emission, and in there the, the pharmacists uh, have got a a, a very uh, predominant uh, role because they are the most they are the most uh, um, skilled. Uh, Experts, they are the real experts in in the medicines, and they are in very close contact with the uh, um, uh, with the patients and, and and with the people that's going to use and consume the the, the medicines. So they are uh, fundamental for transferring uh, um, uh, uh, all the information that the people need to make a good use of the of the medicine. It was also very nice to hear that the uh, the pharmacists are, are also working not only in improving um, uh, uh, these messages that are taken to the to the uh, to the patients but on uh, like making the change in the in the culture of use of uh, uh, medicines by going to the general uh, uh, public and going to the, the secondary students is like uh, ensuring that in the future when they become a patient because when you are 16 years old you're not uh, uh, usually a patient of anything, um, but when they become a patient, they, they make a good use of the of the medicine. So so, uh, all in all, uh, that, uh, I think that's all that I wrote. Uh, um, uh, and uh, many thanks to to all of you that prepare presentation, guide um, uh, the discussions, and and round tables and. Again, Anne. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, that's all from my side. I don't know if somebody has anything to add or, but.